Hey, what's up, bookworms? We are back with another interview with the author. This time, I get to definitively ask him, Ryan, how uh, do you say your last name? Oh, and see, now I forget. You have me on the spot. And it's just Kyle. Kyle. What, I'm what saying Kyle. Is, sorry, I, I, as, as I were on this talk. What the hell? Did sorry. I break something? Everything went weird there because I'd opened up YouTube. Uh. And... <laughs> all right of echoes happening uh if you've got the live stream open at the same time yeah it's gonna be a little delayed if you're watching on if you're you know since you're on stream you're with me I, I i just this all started off in craziness okay so now we're back everything's fine live and, baby um, so, hey I just, we're I just live. feel like the world the world just broke in front of me right there <laughs> because I, I muted youtube and i was still hearing myself back i didn't know what was going on yeah. and yes sorry let's go back on track here because we're already going off on a tangent it um, won't be the last one. It will not be the last one. Yeah, no, just Cahill. But what even happens, so even my, um, my uh, the word, word fiancé get a bit weird, but my fiancé, Amy, she wants to take my surname. She just likes the idea of it. But it's really funny because every time you put her on the spot how to pronounce it, she gets really confused. And she's like, oh my God, I'm going to, how do I, Cahill, Cahill, Cahill. And, you know, she's going to be, Having that as a surname, I won't even know how to say it, which is great. I think that's hilarious. That is right. But by the way, early congratulations. You know, uh, when you oh, got like you. three weeks, three more weeks. Yeah, we leave in nine days. Mm. Nine days. And then, yeah, we're going to get married this day. That's not this day. It's 20 days from now. 20 days from now. All right. All right. Good time. So I think I get a good lead off question here. When you had that discussion with your soon to be wife of, Hey, I'm going to quit my day job. I'm going to write full time. How'd that go over? Did that go over pretty well? It's pretty smooth Actually, sailing, right? Yes. She's really, really, really chill. And she's really kind of um, really supportive. And I think at the time the way it worked was we were moving to New Zealand. So I was working full time. And then I had also done the writing and I launched the book in March and then I had to leave my job in May because we were leaving for New Zealand in July. So I didn't really have a choice. So I was leaving the job anyway. And then when we landed in New Zealand, we got stuck in a COVID lockdown for six months. So I couldn't look for a job if I wanted to. So hmm. in May, when I quit my normal job, I wasn't really earning enough. I, I was earning money, but not enough to, to safely go full time. But then, you know, December hit, I launched my first, I lost, launched my second book and and it was fine. And now she's like, okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Just don't I find forward. that when you have good results, it's usually a much easier conversation. You know, it's, it's a lot easier conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause I think if I told my wife, you know what, I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to do this YouTube thing full time. She'd be like, hey, excuse me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think it was one of those where because I had to quit to move country, it didn't matter at the time. It wasn't really a conversation. Like I couldn't keep my job and leaving. Oh, thank you. That's lovely. <laughs> I, was, I was only, I was only thinking I need a haircut. So that's actually, that's, that's really nice. But um, yeah, so you got him flustered now. He doesn't know what to say. He's speechless now. Irish people in particular cannot take nice things. Mm. It just doesn't work. You know, I, I'm actually more comfortable with someone telling me to go fuck myself. And I'm like, yeah, well, you fuck yourself too. Um, but uh, yeah, it was a much easier conversation, like because I had to quit it because we're leaving. And then when by the time I actually had to make the choice, it was okay. So. Yeah, Brent here right, started reading about the same time as me. He's already blown past me. He's he finished the exile already. I'm gonna be in exile uh, this 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 month. Uh, but I think, I think he's gonna from start warming. I think from what you said, I think you're gonna I think you're gonna like the exile. Okay. Well, I mean, I am I am quite the uh, the fan of House of Tyrese because it sounds like House of Trades. That's not the only reason, but you know, it's finally arrived. I like where you know what. That's one of the questions I got, and I know the answer. And first, I was like, dude, everybody knows what that is. But then I thought. Hmm. Mike, not everybody's read as much fantasy as you. You want to know what is a wyvern, and is it wyvern yeah, so or wyvern? I, and I would say wyvern, but honestly, it's one of those I don't really care that much. Hmm. Like, but for me, there was one thing that I wanted to do because I've always loved the idea. People always say like, you know, it's not a dragon unless it has four legs and two wings. I'm like, that is such a Western view of the world. Like, you have like so many different types of dragons across the world. Like, you have Chinese dragons, different types of Asian dragons, all across Asian mythology, they're all still dragons. Like, so for me, I always loved like George R. R. Martin's approach. Um, with the idea of there is no creature in this world that has biologically evolved to have four legs and two wings in the way that a, that type of dragon does. Whereas the dragons in his books make sense. They're evolved in the same like anatomical way as bats. Mm. And it, it makes a bit more sense. And for me, I've always found it easier to, to realize that. So people kept saying, no, your dragons are wyverns. I was like, no, they're fucking not. I'm putting wyverns in the book. Okay. So now I have dragons and wyverns. You can't argue. 
So for me, in these books, um, wyverns are kind of like they're they're smaller, kind of thicker bodied, um, and they don't breathe fire. And there's no kind of mystical connection to them. They're far more beast like. Okay. All right. Sweet. Yeah, with me it was just like one has four legs, one has two, and one can't breathe fire. That's what I've always thought, but you know. But, but everybody can make their own so rules. Because it was one has four, one has two, with a lot of like kind of Western stuff, I was like, no, fuck it. They both have two. You know, screw you guys. You know, dragon can be whatever it wants to be. Don't you put dragon in a box. All right, so I got like two pages of questions, and I didn't put any of them in order, so it's just going to be all over the place. Just let you know that a lot of them are about the writing method. So to kind of, me and you have kind of had these talks uh, off camera, and uh, I just kind of want to bring it up. Uh, Really, what is this secret code that you seem to have cracked that a lot of other self-pub authors are struggling with, and that it seems like you've had way more success, and you're doing this 100% writer, director, producer, all by yourself, right? Except like the artists. You're doing pretty the much only everything thing by yourself. Is, the only thing is the audiobooks. So um, I do have a publisher for the audiobooks because that was just easier at the time. Like that, that was pretty decent. Um, but everything else is all, yeah, completely me. So how, how, do, how what's your secret? That's what everybody wants to know. What is your secret? But, I got that question about a million times. It's always the funniest one because like I think I think humans are conditioned to always want the shortest path to everything and to always want it. They always believe it's a silver bullet. And I did an interview with Library of a Viking about self-publishing and we started it and finished it by saying there is no one thing you can do there is no top three things you can do it, it's not how that works and straight afterwards all i got was messages people saying hey can i pick your brain like the, the one thing you thought was the the, the best and i was like you clearly didn't watch the interview because you know that's that doesn't work there was just there's so many like so many factors to it there's so many different approaches as well so it's, it's really hard to pin it down on a broad stroke. I mean, I'm not a writer, but I got to think that the one thing that I would say is work hard, right? And I know that some yeah. people, we talked about this, a lot of people just seem to, whenever you tell them to work hard, they just act like you're insulting them. I people, I don't think so. That's the way I was like, raised, work hard. Uh, yeah. you take yourself seriously, treat it like a job is always things that I'm going to think of when I'm yeah. in this department. And honestly, that is, that is a lot of it. People don't like being told the answer is work hard because they're like, well, I'm already working hard. It's like, yeah, no, you might, you might be, but... You might not be working hard in the right specific things or there's loads of things you can change, but it's not about someone not working hard. It's just that if you're not doing it, it's not going to work unless you get struck by lightning. Hmm. So it's it's one of those. And even when it comes to getting lucky, I was talking with um, Ronnie Verdi a while ago, Aura Verdi, um, and I've said it a few times where it's like, it doesn't matter if you get lucky, if you're not working hard. Hmm. If you haven't put the work in to take advantage of the luck, it will still pass you by. So... Like for me, like one of the bigger things when I had started, when I was writing, I was working full time, 12 hour shifts, switching between night shifts and day shifts in, um, in a lab. And so I was, I was getting up at 6am, going to work at seven, not getting home till 8pm at night. Then I was going to the gym for an hour and then I would make a dinner. And then I sat down at my computer in the kitchen from like 9pm till about two or 3am. And then I get up at six and go to work. And I did that on repeat. So I was doing three, four hour nights sleep for probably about a year. And um, trying to get writing done while still doing my job. So like, if I didn't do that, we wouldn't have the books. They wouldn't be published. I remember when I was young and I could just forgo sleep. It was great. Great, great times. I, I, I Yeah, it's a weird one. I think for, I don't even remember the time before that. But yeah, I've been running off four or five hours of sleep for probably probably 15 20 years yeah yeah sometimes i get some good some good nights in it's nice i enjoy it while you're in prime i want to point out that uh, madison did finish of darkness and light today she was texting me about the ending uh it was one of my best friends here and she wanted me to make ah. sure that you know that she's a big fan of the taint take that right <laughs> okay it went over well she'll be she'll be overjoyed she would be overjoyed to hear this yeah. so. oh man that was yeah that hit hard all right. Yeah. Uh, here, <laughs> now that I've got us all, all over the place here. In your first, in your time since first publishing, what advice would you give to someone who is interested in publishing today that might be different than just a few years ago? Well, there, there's a lot, and and one one thing, just as as a side note to what you just said a minute ago, is something you said, which I think is probably if I was, if someone told me pick one thing, okay, pick one 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 thing, I'd make it two things. Unfortunately, now that I think about it, first one has to be write a good book. But with that caveat, is you need to treat it like a job. 
it's your passion and like some people are saying to me now when i'm going away on on my holidays and don't don't write please don't write and i'm like no because i love writing i'm gonna write when i'm when i'm away it just won't be on a schedule and when it's not on a schedule i love it but you have to treat it like a job because that's what it is it will never be it's the same thing as um when you're going to an interview you know dress for the job you want not the job you have absolutely and it's the idea that like even if you're not a professional writer you need to treat it like you're a professional writer everything needs to look professional crisp clean doesn't matter if the art is beautiful on your book cover if it's not professional if it doesn't suit your brand doesn't shoot your genre it doesn't matter how good it is if it's not on point um but yeah the, the one thing i would say if you're talking about a shift in the last few years is is probably just do a lot more research in publishing um to do with traditional publishing and self-publishing there's been a massive shift in the last four or five years in what's viable and what's not um, and there's a podcast at the minute now called the uh, it's a publishing rodeo which everyone's listening to with uh sonny dean i probably got that name wrong pronunciation wise if i did i'm really sorry and um, scott drakeford and it, it's fantastic and it has a great insight into maybe the expectations that people have for traditional publishing versus what the reality is right. and it's understanding mm-hmm. that you know what the difference is for you what you want and understanding what your goal is with writing you know if you don't know what you're going for it's very hard to get there because you can take all the wrong paths and only you only you're two years down the line before you realize oh crap i probably should have done all of this differently so it's taken the time and the research because i think for the first time in the publishing industry in the last five or six years authors have what publishers never wanted them to have which is options right publishers never wanted authors to have options because if you have an option you can walk away from a bad offer so i think right now with self-publishing with the the level of professionalism self-publishing and the the number of people making full-time livings um in in self-publishing as opposed to traditional publishing it's it's just so viable it does almost seem like a like an iron age of sorts. You know, you're seeing people, you know, crowdsourcing their material and things like that and actually putting this stuff together on their own kind of, I want to say like cutting out the middleman, but, you know, taking care of their own, dis- controlling their own destiny, I think. And I think that's but just it, it awesome. Is, <clears throat> it is that way. There, there's a lot of good. I never wanted to like rag on both. There's a lot of good in traditional publishing. There is. If you get the right ways and the right things, but there's a, there's a lot of bad. And, and right now, it is, there, there's, a, there's literally thousands, tens of thousands of indie authors making full-time livings. And some of them, like anything, the people in the top 5% are raking in money. And then the other the people in the mid are just doing okay. And then there's a, because you can have so many, there's probably millions who are earning nothing. But if you're looking at something as a career, you don't look at the bottom. You have to try and look at least to the middle and go, what can I do? No, when I first started like researching this, I was like, so, I mean, the ultimate goal for a self-published author is to get signed by a label, right? Now I'm like, oh, well, no, I guess, I guess it isn't, right? Not at all. If you listen to the, the publishing rodeo, you, you'll see like these authors that you think are doing so amazingly in traditional publishing. When you talk to them, they're like, yeah, that's not how that works. Mm. Because, you know, they're never going to, People have always been so scared of traditional publishing houses and stepping across them the wrong way because if you did, you'll never be published. You don't have an option anymore. They don't want they don't want an author who's talking out about the problems inside the industry. But people are starting to now because there's options and you're starting to see a little bit more of it. And you know, it's it's just good to be able to really understand what you're coming in for. Right on. And and oh. I think that uh something that I wanna kind of just ask you, because not that we're in uh an apples to apples comparison here, but I get a lot of creators who ask me how have I been successful with this? And I've kind of said the same thing, work hard, make sure that you're consistent, be honest, be yourself kind of thing. And you'll be surprised how many people, Oh, no, that, that, that isn't right. And I'm like, then why did you ask my opinion? Now I'm not saying I know everything. I'm saying you've asked me what works for me. And I've just told you, and you've told me I'm wrong. Do you get that same thing when people ask oh, you what works for you and the, you're doing it wrong? All the time. But I think the approach when I used to work and I still have a kind of um, analytical mindset to a lot of stuff like this. And I think we had a, an approach in, in the pharmaceutical industry, um, which I think is common in a lot of places called the five whys. And basically it would mean you say, look, there's, there's water on the ground. Why? Oh, well, there's, 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 a, there's a leak. So most people stop there. So they'll say, 
oh, there's water in the ground, there's a leak, we have a leak, we should fix the leak. Okay, but the reality is you shouldn't. You should keep asking why. There's water in the ground, why? There's a leak. Why is there a leak? Oh, well, it turns out we don't have the right piping. Why don't we have the right piping? Oh, because the guy shortchanged us. And now you know how to fix the problem going forward. And I think it's exactly the same when it comes to, to that sort of stuff and those questions is that people want the first why, but they ignore the rest of the whys. And they might have done something very similar to you and they don't ask, they ask why it was different and they'll go, oh, because it didn't work. And then they stop. Whereas there's a lot more whys to dig into. I think that's that's the difference. There's a lot of subtle differences, like stuff like newsletters. I, I was always told, like a lot a lot of authors that I know, like look, there's no point in them. People don't interact with them. You know, they're they're crap. Shoot, and I read your today. Like, <laughs> yeah, and but the, the thing for me is, I've seen some other newsletters, and they're like, I have a book out. You should buy it. This is the cost. Um, doing something next week, and I'll talk to you later. And like I sit there, that that newsletter took me two hours to write like i'll sit down i put time into it like i sit down and go i want this to come across i think like using everything like it's um it's an opportunity for your readers to start understanding who you are every time i talk to a reader i want them to be able to like understand a bit about me so if i'm going to send the newsletter out i want to write it like i would write it i want to write the stupid jokes that would pop into my head and i want to kind of like just you know help people understand me because i think when people under what's the easy way to put it i think a lot of readers sometimes they want to follow a journey and follow a person. So if they understand who you are, they're supporting you and they, they like to know the people, everyone, it's human nature to, to like to know the person you're supporting. So I think it, it depends how you use things. It's not just like, tick, it's not a tick box exercise. What did you do? Well, I did all these five things and I'm not famous and I'm not, I'm not like a hundred thousand subscribers on YouTube. It's like, yeah, you did them, but did you do them mm. really? Right. <laughs> uh Bo talking about Dragon Con. That's that's gonna be your only uh US visit this year, correct? Yeah, yeah. I'm really looking forward to it. I've never I've never been stateside since being an author, so it's gonna be cool. I have applied, I haven't heard back yet. Uh they actually tweeted at me today asking me if they could help like speed up the process. I'm like, sure. You know, I don't even know if they're gonna approve me or not, but you know, I, I I'm not gonna book a flight before I know. So yeah. I hey, look if they, if they if they're tweeting towards you. I, I was trying to think of the correct word there, tweeting at you, tweeting around you. Um, you never know. Like I mean, I really only have, and then I heard back and it was like, oh, wow, cool. They only have room for so many people and I wouldn't really consider what I do anything like <laughs> important within the industry. But, you know, hey, cool. It, it, it doesn't hurt to ask, right? You know, never I don't, they're the same as me. I was, I put myself forward and I was like, I don't know if I can do, I don't know if, I, if I, I'm ready for this. Like, am I really at the level where they're going to say yes? Right. Um, so yeah, it was pretty cool to, to get that. So how do you balance writing with personal life and duties and what does your writing routine look like? So honestly, for a long time, I just didn't, I just did it all. And there was no balance. I think that's kind of the same with a, a lot of, a lot of the authors who you'll probably see. And I, that, that's kind of the thing is there's hard work. And then there's just really, really fucking hard work. There's mm -hmm. just like, you know, the work you don't, you just don't want to do. Like you can work hard and kind of move forward, but then there's work you go, Jesus, I don't want to do that. And that's what I was saying is I was working like 18, 19 hour days and a lot of it in the middle of COVID and stuff. So for a while, like, like my partner, she just didn't see me that often. That was it. It was just not when I was releasing of war and ruin, like we came over here and I was, I just didn't do anything. I just didn't go anywhere. Like I just get this done seven days a week. Like I'm writing, this book needs to be done. Like, so now I'm starting to, to balance and learn and I'm trying to, I have like a, a Pomodoro method, um, which is basically like the kind of the sprinting method where you'll do like 30 minutes of writing, 10 minute break, 30 minute writing, 10 minute break. And I'm trying to do that now and get it like written in the morning and, you know, trying to get to answer some emails and do some admin and get my break and take my weekends back eventually. All right, so I feel like we should we should address the uh, the book length here. So I ordered of Darkness and Light and Born and Ruin on the thirtieth. Still hasn't gotten here. Possible it broke the axle on the delivery truck. I just have to say thank you so much for shipping these to me from New Zealand. It had the postage price on the box. You're a madman. Uh, thank you so much. But uh, yeah, when I first bought of War and Ruin on Kindle before I read the series, I, I bought on Kindle and it popped up and it said like sixteen hundred. So I think. I must have got a glitched error or something. I got a messed up copy or something. People are like, it's, no, that's 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 right. 
it's such a funny one and it shows the disparity between how readers view books and how authors view books because readers always view them in pages and um, authors view them in words and there was a really interesting one I saw recently so when I finished my novella just there the ice and um, so that's 54,000 words and um, someone was trying to say oh it's 200 pages and the funny one they compared it to Brandon Shan- Brandon um Dawn Shard and Edge Dancer and <clears throat> The funny one for that exact one there is Don Shard is 15,000 words longer than Edge Dancer, but it has less pages. Just because of the way they formatted it. Right, right. They just changed it to make it have less pages. And that's the funny one for, for me. So if I had printed a Warren Ruin in the same formatting as of Darkness and Light, it would be 1,400 pages. Okay. So that is actually the legitimate count. But my printer only goes up to a thousand and fifty pages, <laughs> so I had to I had to bring it all down. So, did you ever? I guess how the way I struck this because I don't think anyone ever sets out saying, you know what? Unless it's Brandon Sanderson, who's like, each book's got to be longer than my last one. Did you set out saying, you know what? The idea I've got for this book, it's going to be long, or did you just it just kind of grow to that? And you were like, I don't feel like cutting anything out because it's all good. It, I love it honestly. All kind of sucker punched me in the face. So I knew the books were long. I knew they were going to be long. Like say the second book of Darkness and Light is is long. Like it's mm. 250,000 words, which is which is a big book. Like that's that is wheel of time book length. That's a that's a solidly long book. Um and I had budgeted for of War and Ruin to be about 300,000 words. Um and usually up until that point I've been plus or minus 5-10%. So I've I've been pretty good at gauging where it's going to go. And it was just it comes with dealing with all these different story threads um, that they can just roll out of control. Not even out of control, it's just because there's more. Say like, for instance, Kalen's storyline for Vor and Rune probably has a similar word count to Darkness and Light. But there's more points of view. And the right. difference is every one of them, okay, so uh, all of the main story threads you might have seen in the previous book on Darkness and Light are all double the length. So the diff- in the War and Ruin. So those side POVs get a lot more screen time um, or page time, I suppose is the way to put it. And then it just kind of goes. And that's the reason it ended up becoming this mad scramble. Because I'm at the end going, yeah, yeah, don't worry. It's going to be about 300,000 words. And like my editor's there. It's like, okay, 300,000 words. And I proofread it. Okay, I'll lock that in. And I'm, I'm going through. And I'm like, yeah, guys, I think it's probably maybe closer to 350, 350. <laughs> and then I was like, look, I'm going to, I'm going to be honest with you here. I'm going to just going to balls to the wall. This is probably going to be about 430. Wow. And they're like, you're a dickhead. <laughs> okay. I'm stunned to credit it. Yeah, it's... <laughs> I mean, just managed to get right in. now, it seems like they're trying to get all these authors to split their books into two now if they get that big. So I'm stunned they printed it. See, I think the thing for me was, so I refuse to split any book um, unless it's for a story or narrative purpose. Um, and I would, I would split it. I don't see the point in pretending one story is two stories. Um, and I think the problem with the likes of Amazon is they don't actually allow me to list two volumes in a single listing. Yeah. It split volumes don't work for indies. Um, they just don't, uh, because usually you'll see that in like bookshops and stuff. It just doesn't work on the Amazon listing. And then everyone who buys ebook will think you're being like, um, you're trying to make a price grab. Right. Right. Because you, you can't split the hardback. If it would get very, I get a lot of questions if I had like a full ebook here and then it only has half of the paperback. And the other half is somewhere else. My life would be miserable. Well, I think about uh, this question here about Storm of Swords. When Storm of Swords first came out on paperback, I remember you could get it on two separate paperbacks. You know, both 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 parts. So I'm actually probably, but yes, you told me it did have a bigger word count than Storm of Swords, right? I'm pretty sure. I can't remember what the Storm of Swords was, but um, of War and Rune is four hundred and thirty-seven thousand. It's like four fifteen. So yeah, just reread I, I it. I think yeah. My my, my head is saying four twenty. 424, but I could be wrong. So how many yeah. pages is this book four going to be? <laughs> you can't tell me the well, future. <laughs> but this is the funny one, right? So no matter what, it will not be longer than 1,050 pages because I cannot print it longer than that. The book could have an extra 100,000 words, but it's going in 1,050 pages. Mm. My printer literally does not print books longer. <laughs> you could do like that that James Eilington book I'm reading right now where he just decided they were going to print on like five-point font to keep it under 700 pages. <laughs> so. Oh, man. Yeah. But I think it, it's the thing for me, and there's part of the reason why... Oh, is it 424? Yeah. Ah, 
sorry i saw a comment there and i was yeah. like yes look at that memory but um yeah it's a weirder one because uh because traditional publishing relies so much on the print industry like their margins come in the print industry whereas my margins don't come in the print industry i sell most of my stuff in an ebook um whereas i'm selling a, actually actually selling quite a lot more physical books than i used to i think this year so far i've already sold over double the physical books i sold in all of last year um which is really cool because i wasn't seeing a lot of that last year mm. so that is nice and um, the only problem is trying to get the pricing down it's 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 just more expensive to print the indie books because we're not printing thousands at once because we know where to store them well let me just tell you uh, i have a minor in marketing and i'll tell you a marketing genius is offering the the fall for free that's just it's brilliant because 90 pages low commitment it slaps that helps you know yeah you feel confident about that and hey sign up just give me your email address boom you've gotten a free book i i mean of all the things we don't agree what agree with as people i think we all agree on one thing free is fun it's universally loved so that's a that's great it's a great idea that, that was it like I, it was weird because when i was doing a lot of my research before i am um, published you know there's a lot of other genres like you know thrillers and stuff and actually where i got the idea is a guy called mark dawson who's a massive kind of self-publishing guru and he writes thrillers and he writes the um is it john milton books and the first one's called the cleaner but he does whole courses on this sort of stuff and he's like yeah like it's called a reader magnet like you want to just you give one book away let people taste it and then they might like your books and i just don't think a lot of people were doing it in fantasy and i kind of went well why don't i just write a book that's like a like a fucking human hand grenade in a book mm. and then just throw it out there. And you're like, the purpose initially for that book was, I want to show you, this is what we're going to get to. Right. That's why right. I told everybody, like, read the I want you guys, mm -hmm. it, it's kind of like, it's kind of like me whispering, have patience in your ear when you start a blood and fire. Mm -hmm. And like, but I wanted to write it in a way that I could use it for the people who'd finished a blood and fire as well. So to, to kind of, cause I didn't have my second book out. And one of the key things with, with the marketing that a lot of other authors are actually probably asked, and it's a good question to answer if any newer authors are, are watching it, is, you know, they'll try things like doing the free runs. Like I've done some free runs on books or I've given away, yeah, I know, <laughs> it's, it's true. <laughs> um, but I've done them and people go, oh, well, I gave away 600 free books and my sales didn't go up. I'm like, yeah, of course it didn't go up. Like, they just got your book for free. Why would your sales go up? But the reality is it's not about the book you're giving away for free. It's about your other books. Right. So it's the general idea of there's no point in funneling loads of fish down a stream if you don't have a net to catch them so if you don't have a second book i wanted something where i go hey i don't have a second book for you right now but i have a free one see but now you made this yeah. trap now you have to write a novella between each book just to hold people over but i actually so it's one of those where i think for me it, it's it's part of something that i've conditioned it all into that i really kind of like now, it does get me that I don't get to jump straight into the next book each time, like the next bigger book, but it does it does a lot. Like it gives me a bit of breathing room. The indie the indie scene is is far quicker turnaround than trad. Like it's, it's common for people to wait two or three years for a trad book or eight years or 12 years. Um, <laughs> no names. But, but um, <laughs> it's common to wait two or three years. It's not in the indie realm. If you, lose, if you wait two or three years between a book, you will lose your readers. Like unless you're you're some lightning strike, there are some people who just retain them, and that's just mm -hmm. the way it works. But um, for me, it gives me breathing space. I give out these novellas, but then I also get to I get to tell these other stories in the world, which is fun for me, and I get to deepen it. And in a way, there is actually a a psychological trick as well, which I just think is pretty cool. So there's a thing um, that a lot of authors when you're when you're when you're publishing, the thing you need to pay attention to is read through. So how many, how many people go from book one to book two and then book two to book three and then on and on, right? And if you're hitting like 50 to 60% reading from book one to book two, you're in a very good place, all right? But from book two to book three, you're, you should be expecting 80% plus, mm -hmm. right? But with the novellas, by the time you finish book one, you're actually at book two. And the idea being the reason that retention increases is because people are more invested in your series. Absolutely. So for me, it's like a trick. I'm releasing my fourth book, but when that releases, it will be my seventh book. Right. So the idea being that people aren't four books invested, they're seven books invested. And by the time they finish my first book, they're two books invested. 
So the amount of people who go from like my read through is quite high. Like my read through from book one to book two is anywhere between 70 and 80 percent, which is which is very, very, very high. Um, but it's because I think anyway that people have more investment because they have the other book they read. So it's technically a book two to book three. So it was a little bit of a, I love the whole psychological stuff with it because that's what marketing is about. Absolutely. I, we're going to get to influences here in a minute. So uh, I, this one was interesting. Was it nice, nice background? Are they inspired by Green Lantern? No, no. Um, I don't actually have an extended answer for that one. I, uh, I, I would never even have thought of that. Okay. Because I know I, I did message <laughs> you uh, when they got to the, it's not a spoiler, guys, because you don't know what we're talking about. I just said, was Portal Heart, well, Portal Heart, was that inspired by Stargate? And you said, absolutely. Yeah. So, so it's uh, one of those where people know that I do that. I love putting Easter eggs and loads of bits. I do it on purpose, very intentionally. Most of the stuff, there's very few accidents in the book um, that I've found. There probably, there probably is, but a lot of it is intentional. Um, but like for me, actually, some of the inspiration for the Knights of Acheron is, you know, Acheron in Greek history and like the, the river, um, there's been multiple names for it, but like with the souls of the dead and stuff. And the idea with the Knights of Acheron is that, you know, you have essentially people who are dying, who have, you know, kind of finished their time in the mortal realm and you're being given a second chance to uh, come back and help the ones you love. Hey, how do you get paid when someone reads your books through Kindle Unlimited? Is it by page count? Just always one. Yep. yep, it's by page count. So huh. the way it He's works not is lacking there, guy. For, yeah, <laughs> when, you, when you pay for your subscriptions for Kindle Unlimited, it all goes into this big massive pool called the Global Fund. Um, and then what they'll do is how much you get paid per page is determined by how many pages were read in that period. So hmm. it, the more authors come in, the more books that are in, the more pages that are in, the more that will get diluted, um, which is probably so. That's why a lot of us were interested when they, in they increased the price of Kindle Unlimited because we're going, well, is the pool going to get bigger or are you just taking more people's money? So we don't know yet. We're going to find out. Bro, I got so many nasty messages yeah. after your April <laughs> Fool's joke. I got, I got savage. I was like, it's just for fun. But you know what the funny thing is? It's like some people still didn't know. There was someone, I, 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 when you said you had finished the ice the other day, I was like, hey, guys, on the Discord, I was like, you know, Ryan just said he just finished the ice. And someone was like, he finished it back in April. I got it on my Kindle. I was like, open it. And he came back. Oh, in. He just made like a I mean face emoji. You still didn't know. Yeah. Because I know like I kind of, I said it on Twitter a while ago and I said it in my mass, mass newsletter as well. Because I was like, I just, I want to let people know this because, you know, they, they need to know. Um, I didn't realize with people who still didn't know, which is kind of <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> yeah. I got some nasty, nasty messages, and I was like, <laughs> "I was like, I, I was kind of sitting there actually." So one of my um, one of my readers, um, and he's a beta reader as well. Adam kind of had this idea. He was like, "Oh, you should do like an April Fool's prank, right?" And I was like, "You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna take that up a few levels, and I'll let you know uh, when it happens." Hmm. And um, so I don't know. I, I just felt like a lot of people have April Fools go by, and they're like. I think you're ugly, April Fools. Ha, ha, ha. I, like, I, want I want to do a, I want to do a fucking April Fools joke. I want to like, you know, put it together, make an ebook. I'm gonna do up the blurb. I'm gonna get the cover ready. You know, copyright pages, everything, and just yeah, boom. Uh, so you were talking about the, the how fast you turn stuff around. I'm actually quite amazed. You literally just finished writing the ice like 48 hours ago. It's in beta, and you're still talking about it's gonna release in like eight weeks. It's gonna be in our hands. Well, it all depends. Like, what was what was really funny was um, which is which is a total new one for me. So I I finished it and I cleaned it up and got it ready for my beta readers and I sent it to my beta readers at three a.m. Okay, I woke up at eight and two of them had finished it. <laughs> Maniac. Okay, now this is fifty four thousand words. That is not a small book, right? And they're not just reading it; they have it on a Google Doc file and they're going through leaving inline comments and they finished it in that time before how, I woke. For comparison's sake, how many is the exile? The exile is forty seven. Okay. So it's longer right. than the exile. All right. So, you know, it's it's not a short like it, it's short novel technically, but it's it's like it's not a small book. Like it, finishing it in that time is, is not a mean feat. Um but I don't actually have I don't have a a release date for the ice right now. I could have it out. I actually don't think there'd be a problem with having it out in eight weeks. But it just depends because I have my wedding soon and because um, all that's going on, um, what it will actually be. 
and I want to try and sort out the audiobook and stuff. Um, but it, it will be ready pretty soon, I would say. It's just it's a case of getting it off to my editor and getting it back and seeing whether she thinks it's a piece of shit or not. So <laughs> And that is gonna be three point five, right? The fall is the only one you can yeah. read out of order. The rest are in between the books, correct? 2. Yeah, 5, that's kinda 5. that that's how I, it's a weird one. I would actually say like if you really wanted to fuck around with stuff, um you, you could read all the main books and then read all the novellas. I don't right, think that would right. be the worst. But I think for me, the way I've written them, if you want to get the maximum out of the experience, I would read them like that. I would read the novellas. It, afterwards, I would read the novellas in between. And well, I'll tell you how, how, how I think it's working is I'm usually that type of person. Like, I love the Dresden Files. I never read any of the side stories. Never read any of them. And I felt like I was fine with that. So if you've got me wanting to read your side stories or novellas, however you want to call them, I... I think you're doing something right and so i'll be interested after you read the exile because outside the fall so the exile and the ice are both essentially in-depth character studies um, and like that's man. what they are they're deep dives into single characters and their motivations and it's something that i find i find really fun and what i wanted to do was i wanted to make it so that you can read the series without them but if you read them everything will be so much better like, well, I mean, I, after I finished The Darkness of Light, I was like, well, I like Dane. And I felt like I didn't get enough of that. And people are like, you're in luck. So, yeah, I'm excited to do it for sure. Yeah, I, I loved writing that story. And there's things, what I've tried to do in in each of them is actually lace so many threads through them that go into the other books that once you read them, you should then be going, fuck, that dude, this thing. And like, that's kind of the way I want it to be. It's like there's stuff in the exile that you get to the end of a war and ruin. And if you piece them together, you could be like, oh. oh yeah. And there's some now that even some of my beta reads and stuff still haven't pieced together yet. And it's, you know, it's more, I wanted to reward people who reread. So, you know, if you don't reread, you won't suffer. But if you do reread, you will get rewarded by noticing all these small little pieces. I think there's, there's one, one of my readers now who is on her, I think she's going on to her ninth read of the series, which is insane. Wow. That's probably more than me. That's got to feel amazing. So I've got lots of questions about influences. So yeah. not just books, comics, TV shows, movies. What is inspirational to you? Not necessarily just in writing this series, but just, I guess, what kind of pushed you towards wanting to be a fantasy author? Wanting to be a fantasy author? I, I just, it was one of those where I... I've, I've consumed a lot of media. I've read a, a lot of books, although I do not read as fast as the people that I see nowadays. I can't even get into that. I think that's political. Um, but yeah, I just I just loved stories. I've always loved stories. And even even like when you walk into like the living room or the lounge, whatever you call it, and like Amy's watching something that I think is absolute trash. If I watch it for five minutes, I can't leave. Um, not because I'm even interested, but because I need to know how the story plays out. I want to know what they do with the story. And it's just always been the way I've been like wired. That's just it. I need to know how that story finishes, what they did with that story, why those small little things matter. I'm interested with the characters and it's just always something that gets me no matter what. I'm it's very funny to say that because uh, my wife was watching like, I don't know, Discovery Channel or something. It was a documentary about how they make balloons and I was glued to the TV. I couldn't walk away. So documentaries are like my kryptonite with that. I, I will watch a documentary on literally anything. So yeah, hey, how about a Theron novella one day? I bet you get this with every character, don't you? Yeah, like th there's a lot of stuff. Um, there's a lot of stuff that I want to do, and the reality of what it's going to be is the order in which things are done is going to depend on what's financially the best for me. Like because I need to be able to pay my mortgage, so you know these things will get done. I want them to get done. So I've said it before in other stuff. One of the things I want to do is um, I'm trying to think where people are in books without spoiling stuff. So there is, um, yeah, one of the things that I have always wanted to do is do like a full novel or um, like a, a small series on the likes of the Varsand War um, and um, stuff with Theron and stuff would be in that. I'm trying to think because anyone who's up to date, I can say a lot of stuff. But um, if they're not today, I don't want to say a lot of stuff. But that, that is something I do have in mind. Um, I've always had the idea of I wanted to do like a series like in the past at the time of the order. I've wanted to do it when the first time humans arrive in Etheria. There's, there's loads of stuff that I wanted to do because um, there's a lot of story there that doesn't need to be forced. 
Like, I don't need to, like, go, okay, how can I contrive this to make a series out of it? No, I don't have to, because I'm sitting there going, man, I have the same itch to tell those stories as I did this one, so. Well, you know, if, if people are asking for them, I mean, that's a good thing, right? It's always oh, it's a definitely thing. a good thing. So uh, why and how did you start writing? How much time do you spend on preparation slash research for your books? Because I know, guys, if, you don't, if you're not on this Discord, jump on his Discord. He was telling us in there the other day, he was like, I was at the grocery store and boom, I got the idea for book four. I'm done now. It's all up here yeah, now. Like, all up there. I mean, a fucking metric shit ton of research. Um, so I kind of, I think a few people have heard the, the general story when it started it was basically I got a job um, and they didn't have any work for me. So they hired me ahead of time, like four or five months ahead of time before they needed me because they wanted to lock me in. And um, I just was sat there in an office and they wouldn't give me any work. Like, that's no joke. Like, I was requesting work and it was a stage where I had watched, kind of, I watched like two seasons of The Last Kingdom, like in work, because I, I just, I had no work. They wouldn't give it to me. And then after I got through the second season, I was like, Do you know, fuck this. I'm going to write that book I want to write. Yeah. I'm not going to sit around wasting my time. And then I started doing that and it was only a little bit at a time. And then as it got towards like December 2020, I really just, maybe a little bit of November 2020, I was like, got into gear. And that's when it really started to, to go. And yeah, if I hadn't gotten that shit job, I never would have started writing, um, which was, it makes it pretty cool. Yeah, blessing in disguise for sure. Uh, so who is your uh, favorite character to write? And which of the books was the hardest to write? Um, it's like asking you to pick a favorite kid, isn't it? It, it is because I, I like them. I like them all for different reasons. So like what I like, I, I definitely want to have, I want to have a talk at some stage with someone when these are all finished, because a lot of this stuff is, is really intentional. And you'll see like the likes of Kaylin and, and Asin and Kaylin on the surface for me is like, especially in the first book, I want him to come off as this kind of generic, like, I don't want him to come off as generic, but I want people to look at it and go, oh, this is the guy you insert here. This is like your, your, your fan boy thing. <clears throat> and for me, Kaylin and Asin are on things that they're on like an opposite journey. You have a guy who's a hero and learning to be human. And you have a guy who's a human learning to be a hero. And they're both teaching each other. And it's it's subtle and it's slow and it's there, there there is a line that i told one of my beta readers today that i haven't told anyone i'm not going to say it here now but um there's a there's a concept that i've always had when writing them when writing this story and I, i'm going to say it when i finish the last book because for me it changes the whole way you look at the series and um, and so writing those two for me has always been great because i know i know why they're doing what they're doing and why they are who they are and the journeys they're on but I also love writing Dane and I love writing Belina and Dan and Riss. I actually, <laughs> I, there's not many of them I don't like writing because for me, um, each one is in the first book less so, but as you move into like the second book and you get more of the POVs and it's the, the third book. And um, I think the POVs are quite distinct. Like the way I try to make it so they, they each think differently. So you'll get a lot more internal monologue from Dane than you will from a lot of the others. Um, you might have seen that in, in Of Darkness and Light. Like he, he will get a lot more internal thoughts than like actual thoughts than a lot of other characters will. And you have the likes of, of Rist, who his thinking is far more stop start, far more there's this is here and that's there and that's here. And it's trying to tell them differently. So I always find it really fun, like no matter what it is. Jane, it's different shades of green. I just thought, hey, got to represent Ireland, even though he lives in New Zealand now. You know, he's, you know, you, never, you can't forget where you come from. Right. <laughs> Right, hundred percent. You know, I, I, someone asked me, say, point, "Hey, did not so, even notice you're wearing a Maiden Ireland T-shirt." So, oh. yeah, that's one of the facial <laughs> skills. Uh, someone actually had asked uh, in one of the questions somewhere, uh, who, "Who do you support in a rugby game now between New Zealand and Ireland?" Ireland. Right. Ireland. Be like, I, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. Moved here in 1993 and people were like so who are you, who are you going for in this game houston or atlanta i'm like well atlanta i just fucking moved here you know it's gonna take yeah. me a while to kind of grow but i, I don't know like, i know that uh, rugby and soccer are very very sorry football are very very serious yeah. uh you know where you guys come from not so much here yeah i was like till the day i die it's ireland ireland's my country like that's where i'm raised like 
it would be different if I was like moving to a different city or something. But sure. like it's it's quite mm-hmm. a different nation. And but I'll I'll support New Zealand. Like in New Zealand, they're playing different teams. I'll support New Zealand. Um, and and any team that plays England. Have you done the Lord of the Rings tour since you've been in New Zealand? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the first place Amy brought me. But to say, I don't fantastic. think that I would they got... actually grow the vegetables there. They grow them, and then the people who grow them get to take them home. I can't imagine anyone would go to New Zealand and not do the Lord of the Rings stuff. I mean, come on, it's got it had, it had to boost. It had to boost tourism there by like ten thousand percent or something. There was actually one of the first things Amy brought me to was there is like it's just farms and like all over the place, and she literally brought me like trekking through farms in the middle of but fuck nowhere okay <laughs> and i mean i mean nowhere and then there was a hobbit house built into the side of the mountain so mm. the farmer had decided to just put one in that was it like just done the hobbit wonderful. house just there and i was like this is amazing i love this place so uh do you have uh inspirations for the different societies in Aferia? oh yeah yeah loads um i try and draw yeah i try and draw a lot from real life um but then also making them my own. I don't want to just take them. I take, I take inspiration. Mostly the inspiration I take is aesthetic in my mind. So like when I write, I kind of view it like a movie. Like it's very vivid in when I'm writing. I, I would see all of it like a, like a rolling cinema screen, everything. Um, so like the likes of the, the Glade and stuff for me would be kind of more in, like inspired by old Celtic and Irish culture. And even the way Caelan and all would use the words mom and dad instead of mother and father um is again like irish rooted and a lot of it is that that's that area for me you have drafane for me which is quite quite norse inspired and um, not always in just the way they do things but even just aesthetically in, in how they go about it and then in valtara would be quite greek inspired for me and um, even in some of the words that i have later on and you'll see so there are different parts that are just kind of taken from all over i wanted to kind of show very different cultures developing and you'll see like nervona for me is kind of like um as you, you'll you'll see in the ice it's not a spoiler um it's very kind of like 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 i want it to be kind of like like french african um in a, in a, in a it's hard to put it that way because it not not heavily culturally but aesthetically for me that's kind of the way i see it and the way i hear them when they talk um so i'll always draw little pieces from everywhere and then try and kind of like blend it up in my own little thing okay i mean that's 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 better than what i'm getting most days it's just like yeah it's just vikings <laughs> Vikings, are, like i always really find cool. it, there is a funny one all right there's a funny one people say like um oh why is there so much like european medieval uh fantasy i'm like because like you know obviously you know you had this huge a long span of time where it was literally just white dudes like we're authors okay like, which thankfully is changing. Like, you're getting a lot more diversity now. But, like, that's all it was. And the reality is most of the white people came from Europe. Like, if you have... Like, if I went over to, like, to to China or to, to anywhere in the world except America, and the authors who were all there in that sphere, they would likely write that kind of culturally inspired stuff. Right. So it's like, you know, I wrote it because, like, that's that's what I knew. Like, I grew up with European medieval history. Um, like, so I always find it really funny with that. But I, I love... I love taking all the little little pieces and trying to make the world kind of feel real. I think that kind of, I think that's the natural thing with writing is diversity makes the world feel real. Sure. Sure. You know, someone said earlier that they, they, uh, they appreciate that you're putting more dwarves in your books, but like a dwarves would be like the, the one fantasy race. that's kind of just like getting the shaft recently, but I'll say that was the one thing in your books where I struggled with the names because you got all the Z's and stuff in there. <laughs> My eyes start glazing over a little bit. I'm trying to think back. I thought there was only one. Oh, you had like four realms. I, I... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. There is one with a Z. <laughs> but no, that that's awesome. I, I, I kind of agree with that. that. It does feel like dwarves are kind of... Uh, they're almost becoming like the Dwemer in, in Elder Scrolls. They're just kind of disappearing. They're just... I think they were the fantasy race that were just there. You know, they were there. Anyone who's kind of like a talking s inspired world you know, they love the elves and they love that and they loved Gimli. Okay. But then because it was mostly just Gimli, it kind of became like this stock Scottish caricature, especially when like Lord of the Rings came out. Like, and it, it just like, you know, you had the elves, you had everything else. You kind of have to chuck the dwarves in, but most people don't really know what to do with them. You know, they're like, well, you know, how much adventure can you have hiding in a mountain? What are we going to do? Like, you're only going to come out to get some sunlight and have a swim. 
Um, so yeah, it's fun for me to do all the all the different stuff with them, and I I, I very much wanted to take their storyline somewhere that for me is gonna be huge and do some cool shit with them. Like so, this I, right I'm, here, I'm I think it's it. big. Is I personally have a weakness for whenever authors mingle with the commoners, as I put it. They'll just talk to people all the time. I, I that's what made me read John Gwynn's books at first because it was like one of the first authors who like really interacted with me on like social media and stuff. You really put a yeah. lot of work into that. What I think it's one of those things that like for me, it's actually part of what I I really <laughs> love it. Like I like it. Um, I think when I was working in the the lab job and then office jobs and stuff. I like the people I worked with were my friends. When I went places, they were okay, Tiago. <laughs> <laughs> but when I when I was there, they were, they were my friends. And now that like I'm working kind of like in a solitary position, like it's it's really nice to interact with people. Like and these stories for me <clears throat> are like they're as much for other people as they are for me. So it's great. I love hearing this stuff back, and I'm like, you know, I just don't see why I wouldn't be nice to someone unless they were a dickhead to me. And um, mm. I think I could be wrong, but Ben. I think if it's the ben, ben I'm thinking of, um, if you do have a surgery coming up, I hope it goes really well, or if that's happened already, already uh, has gone well. Um, if it's happened already, then it looks like it has gone well. Um, I think I was chatting to Ben a while ago, a really nice guy. Um, but yeah, I don't know, like it's part of the job for me, but it's not, that actually, that part isn't actually a job. Like it's, it's, it is because, holy shit, sometimes I have to sit there for like two and a half, three hours just to catch up on Twitter. Like, right. No, no like joke. the like, other day you told me, Hey, sorry, I'm just getting back to you. I'm like, it's fine. I'm sure you get like a bazillion ads. So, it's, yeah. it's genuinely ridiculous. Like, cause I never even understood. And then recently with emails. So I was getting like, you know, I got like two or three emails a week and it wasn't a problem. Um, now that's minimum a day. And like, I could like be doing bits and I'll turn around and like, I have 400 emails to respond to. And so most people, 99% of people are great in emails, all right? And I'm actually quite lucky. My proportion of emails where people are, are like, just email me to say horrible things is quite small, all right? But mostly lovely. But then there's sometimes where like, you learn a lot about people. Like people share. Like I get these emails and there's some heavy stuff in them. And I'm like, wow, I don't even know if I'm qualified to respond to this. So uh, it, it could be it could be a little bit, a little bit daunting sometimes. No, again, I don't want to make you think I'm comparing myself and an author here. It's different different things here. But what I'm saying is like when I first started this channel and I had like 1,000, 2,000 subscribers, I, one of my things was I was going to respond to every single comment, tweet, message, everything. I can't keep up with it anymore. It's, it's the impossible. Thing, the thing is, right? So what I do, I kind of like, I do get slightly obsessive. So like I like... I won't be able to respond to them, right? The reason, like, so, say I'll see them come through and I, I can't respond to them because if I respond to that one, I have to, I have no choice. Mentally, I have to respond to the last one. I know before, I know before. I don't have a choice. My brain will not let me not do it. Mm. So sometimes I have to leave it and then sit down in two or three days and I will mm -hmm. literally spend three hours and I will comb through almost every single time of a mention and try and respond and reply. And it's part of it is generally I don't have a choice. My brain will just not let me answer to small pieces um but i think what's interesting for me is i see a lot of people being like oh my interactions are down and my engagements are down and i'm like yeah i know because it's social media and you're not being social so mm. like if 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 you have a reader and he or she or they messages you and you don't respond why would they message again like why would they spend their time you know, send loads of stuff to you and then you never respond to them. Even one response out of 10, a lot of readers are like, oh my God, thank you. Yeah. You know, right. so it, it, that's that's what social media is about. And I think, you know, like my engagement hasn't changed at all. My engagement's only gone up. And I, I fucking hate Elmo, all right? But like my engagement's gone up since he's come in and nothing to do with him. I think it's literally just more readers are coming in. But um, it hasn't been affected like at all. Um. But I think it just depends as well. Like I think there was that whole follow for a follow thing. And I think that pe think people don't understand that like everyone hears the word algorithm and they think it's magic. It's like algorithm is the soft magic system of the real world. Right. Like, <laughs> but but it but it's not. It's like so highly calculated. And you know, if you have five thousand followers and you put out a tweet and they're only following you because you followed them and only two of them like them, Twitter goes, Okay, so your content has low engagement. And your content doesn't work with this based off the proportion of people that follow you. 
So we're not going to spread it as much. So you have people following 10,000 people and they have 10,000 followers back. And like just by logic, that's not going to help. Do you have those days though where you're like, okay, I'm Fuck getting distracted. Life. I need to close <laughs> all the social medias and just work on writing. Do you, do you, have you found yourself doing that? Yeah. I've never been the kind of person who just deletes the social media. Um, I think people are different. I think some people need to do that. Um, and some people don't. And for me, I am able to just close my phone and put it aside. Yeah. I don't have to go to the, the extremes of deleting stuff. And, um, I, I have never had to, um, I will just put it aside. That's it. Yeah. Get it done. One but of my number one questions, how do you, how do you find so much time for reading? And I'm like, guys, if you don't doom scroll social media and you don't watch a shit ton of TV, you'd be surprised how much time you have to read. If you're, you know, you don't have a full time, yeah, like, you know, I, I know, I know for me, 24 I, I, hour my job reading suffered. My reading suffered in the last while. And um, just because I don't know, I just, I just can't read. Like I read it and I just, I used to, the only one that's actually got me so far. I, was reading so this is funny for a lot of people right people are like oh my god this is from stormlight archive and i'm like i've actually only read the first book of stormlight right. archive so i actually haven't read the other ones that's um, and I'm in why i went all in on it. that on that review i did for you the other day or yeah. just like dude I, every fantasy series that you love has borrowed from something else it's not it's not like oh i don't have an original yeah. idea it's just that there's things we love about this genre and it's just part of the genre but it actually it actually blew my mind because and um, when people were doing some comparisons because like my history of Brandon Sanderson is finishing Wheel of Time. And I actually hadn't read a lot of it, like The Way of Kings. And I'd only read it like a while ago. And what blew my mind was people go, people kept going, um, soul blades, oh my God, they're like shard blades. But the whole time that I wrote them, I was going, man, people are going to compare these to lightsabers. <laughs> no one, not one person, right? Compared the glowing fucking light sword to a lightsaber. Like they were like, nah, shard blade. And I'm like, man, I can tell where the generations are where instead of Star Wars, we are thinking of shard blades. Um, I can definitely see, I 100% can see the comparison. Oh, absolutely. But it's just, it blew my mind that nobody was going, oh man, this is like, this is like a lightsaber. Like, because that's my, that was my whole worry. I'm like, man, they're going to think this is a lightsaber, but there's so much more depth in the lore of this weapon. I'm going to tell you, you're going to find it out. You will find it out. <laughs> Yeah, no, with me, shit. When I got the part of the soul blade, I was like, well, shit, I'm in. That that is, I, I did say it's like a shard blade, except it's way fucking cooler. <laughs> so, it's, it's, yeah. it's smash it with a lightsaber. <laughs> uh, so, you have anybody? Have you had any publishers trying to to woo you yet? Try to get you to sign um, on with them? No, um, I, I don't think I. It's it's an interesting one because like, it depends. You're trying to you'd be trying you're trying to assume when I say you I just mean the general you uh -huh. you're trying to assume what the way publishers think and the reality is, um, they would want to be coming in with like <clears throat> high eight figures, like as in and I and I think they know that because trad pub knows our traditional publishers they're starting to learn what the capacity for earning is in self publishing. And the, di the key difference is being is that I get 70% royalties on my eBooks. Okay. And I get around that on my paperbacks. Um, there is traditional, traditionally published authors who are taken as low as 2% in certain realms and as high as seven. So in a lot of cases, I have to sell 10 times less books to earn right. the same money. So it, it's, it's a, it's a big difference. And I think a lot of them might sit there and I don't know, it's just, this is all assumptions. And then I kind of go, you know, well, it's going to be too expensive for us to acquire this. And he's already released the first book of the series. Like, I'm, this isn't like a, a one book come out here. This is like, you know, we're six books in now at this stage. Like it's not a small acquiring um, of books that have already been released. Um, hold on. What's this? I got an argument on Mike's Discord about how the Knights of Acheron are not just Mandalorians, but like, <laughs> <laughs> I think that only came in when um, like there's, there's almost nothing in their culture that, uh, that would, tie them to Mandalorian at all, but literally Felix's new illustration has a cool like Mandalorian style helmet. But I think people, which is really funny for me, I don't understand how people have seen the Mandalorian style helmet and not understand that it's just a Greek Corinthian helmet. Mm. Like yeah, it's quite point. literally, like yeah. the visor, it, it is quite yeah. literally taken from a Greek Corinthian helmet. Like it's not a Mandalorian helmet. It's a Greek Corinthian inspired helmet. Yeah, and like, everything else George Lucas took from Frank Herbert. So there's that, yeah. Yeah, uh, but I think this is, but this is, this is the one. But so I, I love that. Like, I, it's always gets to me, and people yeah. are like, 
oh well no this is the same as this i'm like yeah but like the stories are about how they're told so it makes it different the character is like hey i heard you have three i have heard you have three young men ryan is your protagonist in your first book oh. though uh, Mike, I'm, I'm at a stage where I just, I die laughing almost every day looking at this stuff. Like, I had one guy tell me that I robbed, I ripped off uh, Lord of the Rings because I had a mountain pass. <laughs> My characters went to a, a secret mountain pass and I ripped off Lord of the Rings. I'm like, dude, we would just be telling stories. We would be telling, you'd have to trip on acid to invent <laughs> new, like completely new everything. Like, no, that's a me, guy. You know, I can't believe you don't see this. You got like a you got like a, a sage character. You got three men in a small village, and you've got you even have fades. And I'm like, so you never read Lord of the Fucking Rings, did you? <laughs> you yeah, know? Like, so I, was like, I don't I, know. I, actually, it was um, Zamal Akhtar um, who uh, wrote Gold Medal Gods. Oh, I was on a talk with him a good while ago, probably like a year or so ago, and he said something I really liked. And he was basically saying that tropes are only tropes when you don't like them absolutely and, oh. and the reality is to me a lot of those kind of things um people call them tropes but to me they're they're, they're tenets of a genre they're, they're why mm. you come back a much better word that, it, it's what defines a genre it's the reason you love it like when you talk about like the classic fantasy and you were saying a while ago how you love like a like a farm boy and you know the chosen one kind of tropes and stuff um that's because you like those aspects and that's mm. why you want to read those books and then it's, it's about you can have a chosen one trope, which is just like you have a, a, a character who is destined for greatness. That's just, everyone calls that a chosen one trope now, whether they're chosen or not. Of course they're destined for greatness because like, why the hell would I be writing about them if they were just going to have a mundane life? Like, it doesn't make sense. So of course there's, there's going to be something happen. Like, um, but like, you, you, it's about how you write that character, how they interact with the world, if the, what you do with the character and the world and the emotions and how you tell the story and your narrative. And that's what makes different writers different. Like it's. Yeah. Uh, the whole like this rips off, like for example, God, early stages of the, right. of the channel, I said that I didn't understand why people give Aragon by Christopher Pialini so much shit. And I'm like, I really don't understand. And they're saying, oh, cause it's a rip off of this, this, this. And I'm like, all it is is Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. Fucking everything has been ripping off that cycle forever now, in movies. I think the only reason they book. did it was because like, I remember some people were saying I was a while ago when you look back through and you're like, you know, he literally has all the different colored swords, which are the lightsabers and all the sort of stuff. And you go, yeah, okay. The dude was fucking 15. Yeah, right? right? Yeah, like 13 like, when he started writing it. it. Yeah. <laughs> like, but I get compared compare to Aragon all the time for stuff, right? And it's literally, I have a boy and I have a dragon. You get a boy and a dragon, Aragon is a quintessential boy and dragon. All right, and it's one of those where I think at the start I was a little bit like "fuck off," okay? I was like, because I'm sitting there going, "There's there's so much more in this world," like because I I've, I've read the 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 Aragon books. I loved the first one when I was a kid. Quite like the second one. Did not like the last two at all. Um, but like they were they were great, and I was, at the start I was like, oh, "fuck off," like and all this, and now I kind of go, "Do you know what? Yeah, cool." Like if that's if that helps you to look at it, and you're like. Okay, it's like an Aragon for adults. I was like, if you like Dragon Rider stuff, jump in. All right, I got a lot of love for that. I got a lot of love for Christopher Pellini. I think he's a great guy. I think like he's he did a lot for 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 kids in my age at that time, like bringing out these books and kind of providing that middle ground with dragons and accessible fantasy that I quite loved. I I, I like. I love the first book a lot. Right. And when I, I made like that a, video, like defending it, a lot of people that were, you know, in their mid twenties were like, thank you. Thank you so much. You know, it's like, I grew up with it. I can't, I can't see past all those words because I grew up with it and stuff. So I, it brings people to the genre, man. I'm, I, I, I want to support 100%. it. You know? and, and that's it. Like, and I know when I go back that like my inspiration for these kind of books with dragons and stuff is actually more Game of Thrones um, his majesty's dragon by Naomi Novik. That whole series was massive for me like dragon riders of burn like they're very much more where my influences came from in that regard and i had aragon there and obviously it's i grew up with parts of it you know like, oh cool like i i, I love the day of a dragon i want to write that kind of story like but that's kind of where for me a lot of the similarities end like there's obviously loads of tonal stuff especially in the first book you have the same similarities as being hero's journey coming of age they'll all be there those kind of tropes are there like you said it's it's a hero's journey and that's what I kind of wanted in that first book was to create this kind of, I wanted it to be, I wanted to find the nostalgia that I I wanted to get when I went back to read those books. You know, the books you read when you were younger and like, you're going, I love these books. I want to get the nostalgia. And you read them and it just, they just did not live up. 
right. because you're in a different place in your life now. And I wanted to find, to write a book where I could get that nostalgia. Right. Right on. Right on. Yeah. Okay. So tentatively, how many books will be in the series? Not counting novellas, just the main novels. Is it still five? Yeah, I, I think so. <laughs> like I, at the minute with the way stuff is, I think I'd be dragging out the main story past what it needs to be if I took it past five. Um, I think financially it would be great if I brought it up to 12. Like, but I don't think that's where it needs to go. I think like five for me with four novellas should wrap up that main series. And like I said, I don't want to leave this world. I have other worlds that I want to write in, other stuff I want to do. But, you know, there's stuff I want to come back to in this too. But I think this main series, this story that we're telling is probably going to be five books and we're looking at, I only checked you the other day, we are currently at 960,000 words um, in the series so far. So there's a good chance we could brush 1.7, 1.8 million words. Oh, why not just go for two? Printing <laughs> length. <laughs> no, you can always printing. you can always do like uh epilogue novellas just to get there just oh, to get man. to the final goal. so uh, i guess then i would ask after say after you're done with Aphiria, do you have ideas for anything else down the road yeah yeah so like, like i said earlier i have i have stuff in this world all right as well more books that i want to write in different times but then i do also have a few different things that i want to do I've always wanted to write some kind of like like a sci fantasy, like a space opera, like um, in similar veins of Red Rising, Christopher Rocchio's uh, Sun Eater kind of stuff. I've always loved that. I've loved the idea of kind of the the knighthood chivalry in space. Hmm. You know, like, you know, it sounded like what it would do. And if, I bet you Frank Herbert sat in a room and said, you know, I really want to make them fight with swords, but they have guns. Yeah. Like, I know what to do. Like, I'm going to put in a reason for them to fight with swords, which is, I, I just love that idea. I love the futuristic take on what is essentially a medieval fantasy. And um, I've always loved that sort of stuff. You know, you don't see enough of that, swords and guns. We were watching John Wick 4 the other day, and I was like, why is it taken to this moment to realize that I needed people having a samurai a katana and a no. fucking 9 millimeter? Why, why, why did I just not get this? This is probably controversial. I did not like John Wick 4 that much. I loved fucking loved john wick 3 right and if you can kill a guy with a horse in two different ways right. in the same film it's a great film right i i, I, thought, I would I say thought, even... i thought four was a bit repetitive for me it was a bit like the same thing just kept happening like all the time like it, it was crazy i was sitting there i'm sitting there in the cinema and i turned to my friend i was like i'm liking it like aesthetically it's really cool and but it, i just feel like we've watched like a two-hour film but most of it has been the same stuff just repeating. Right, Whereas like right, at no, least in John Wick right. 3, he kept changing the dynamics of what he was doing. Like, and I really love, I loved John. I loved all the first three John Wicks. And the fourth one isn't bad. I just, you know, each one went up and three was so fucking ridiculous in the amount of action scenes I had. And I was going, okay, they're going to just blow the roof off it with four. And they did, but there wasn't enough, like, yeah, like diversity and change in the way they did shit. Like, I was expecting some really cool creative stuff. I think when they threw the 55-year-old or whatever dude from, like, a three-story window and he smashed off a car and he was fine. Mm -hmm. I just, like, no. And my brain just clocked out. It went, like, you could have just made him jump off one story. I said and this. And then I go, oh, like, man, that would have hurt. But he jumped off a three-story fucking window. He'd be dead. <laughs> it, it, it didn't need to be three plus hours, I'll tell you that. Uh, but with that, me, that I, I felt it. like it was but the slowest it. story out of all four of them. I still liked the action. But I said... A lot of people were telling me they felt like, oh, it's the best action. It blows away the action in the other movies. I'm like, I don't know. I feel like there's only no. so far you can go with a with a shoot 'em up before you're jumping the shark. You know, before you're just no, like I, I you're three, putting into the Matrix again. Three for me had the best action scenes. Like, yeah, dude, the, the fight in the weapon shop in part three. Oh my god, that I was, was like laughing out loud. Unbelievable. <laughs> it was unbelievable. amazing. Unbelievable. Like there was there was too many things in this one that just broke. They they broke that sense of immersion for me. Like even that that first scene, the fighting um around the. I can't remember what that big, huge roundabout in, in uh, France is called, but the one they're going around, like they were there literally shooting in the middle of one of the biggest public places in France for a long fucking time. And no police or anyone, no one even stopped. All the cars just kept going. They were like, oh man, I really need to get bread. I'm just going to stay here. Like <laughs> that was ridiculous. I'm watching it going, that's just like, come on, you're not even trying here. And like, I like the film that that's just my, I was sitting yeah. there going, 
<clears throat> oh man, you know. But yeah, I'll go on a rant on that sort of stuff for days. But I, no, I'm, I'm with you. I like I three. I think I like was... three the best. My my son said he liked three the best, but he also liked because it was you know dogs kicking ass in it too. So you know, yeah, so. I, th- I think with four it took me a while. Like I was like an hour and a half in, and I was kind of like I think I was tricking myself. I'm like you know this is good, this is good, but like it's gonna it's gonna go up, it's gonna keep going up. But it it didn't go up. It just kept going that way. Mm-hmm. It kept having the same fights. Like and it never got cooler and cooler. It just it was pretty cool. You had that one scene with the incendiary rounds, which is fucking cool as shit. Right, yeah. And then, and then it kind of just, just kept going. And I was like, ah. I think that was my reaction more than anything. It wasn't like, this is crap. It was like, oh. I'm with <laughs> I, you. I, I, I wanted like a nuclear explosion here. Like, well, I didn't like, expect John Wick to be our derailed tonight. No. Uh, no. Hey, original marketing strategy for a blood and fire. That would be awesome. He self-published and took the community by storm, and I need that knowledge. So did you know? Did you, was there a buzz? Did you have a pretty good idea that this was going to do well? Or did it completely catch you off guard? Or No, but like, I very much look at it like the, the old cliche, like, you know, um, <clears throat> fail to prepare and prepare to fail. Like, I spent six, seven months, like, solidly just researching everything I possibly could. I... Every time I walked, every time I left the house, I was listening to the self-publishing show podcast. I was listening to six figure authors. I was listening to everything. Every minute of my day was, was trying to learn as much about publishing as I humanly could. And it's kind of when it came around to like pricing and stuff and, and launching. And I was going, I think, I think a lot of the times what the problem that people have is they ask questions like that. And then they take one piece of advice and they apply it retroactively and they go, Oh, it doesn't work. I'm like, yeah, I know it doesn't work because you, you didn't, you didn't do it from the start. You didn't apply it with everything else. Almost none of these things work in isolation. And so it was like, we have like the 99 cent deals and people go, oh, well, I'm going to put my book 99 cent. I was like, yeah, but it's been out for seven months. Amazon have already, like they've already charted what your book is doing. Like it takes a while to turn it around. Like that's what the algorithms are. They're, they're tracking conversion rates. They're, tra- they're tracking traffic to your page, conversion rates onto your page. They're tracking like read through to other books. Like if your conversion rates are low, you're six months in because you priced your book at six ninety nine and nobody was buying it. Switching it to ninety nine cent won't just make it magically sell. So it's like there's, there's so much stuff to it. And like my main thing, like with the fall and with everything else, was I wanted to get the fall. And I wanted to get blood and fire out. I wanted to make sure I had a kind of circular loop to give people something to feed back into. I wanted to just get as many readers as humanly possible. People were like, people were like, I spent eight, ten years writing this book and it needs to be six ninety nine because that's what I'm worth. I'm like. That makes no sense. I'm like, oh, why doesn't it make sense? You know, I worked for it. I should charge for it. I'm like, yeah, that logic in isolation makes sense. Apply it to publishing. And you go, is your value or your worth as an author calculated in your overall income or in the individual price of a single book? It's like, it's definitely not in the individual price of a single book. Because if you sell 10 books at 6.99, that is nowhere near as much money as a thousand books at 99 cent. Math. Math. And yeah, but it, it's one of those. And it said, oh, I don't want to give a book away for free because I worked hard on it. The full, I've had the full ebook for free from the very start and that has earned me loads. Because people buy the hardbacks, people buy the paperbacks, they take the fall, they feed the fall into a blood and fire. I'd say the fall has probably sold more books of blood and fire than any of the public, any of the marketing I've done outside of that. Because people get it for free and then I don't have to sell them a blood and fire. They want it. Like, it's, it's really funny because like, oh, how'd you do it? It's like, well, I gave away shit for free. And like, oh, I don't want to do that. It's like, well, don't do it then. Do, do, do what you want to do. <laughs> well, this kind of plays off of that. What are some of the rookie mistakes an author can make from their first self-published book? Uh, 150 million mistakes. Uh, I think, personally, the biggest ones for me are failing to do the adequate research beforehand rushing into publishing um and not being as professional as you need to do need to be and so say rushing into it ties into and not doing the research i think a lot of people it's natural you've written a book and you want to get it out there like you know it's, it's really hard to sit on something you've written like but the idea is as soon as you release something, the snowball roll, rolls down the hill. <clears throat> the cat's out of the bag when you hit publish. So mm-hmm. you have all the time in the world up until then to, to do everything you need. But if you if you rush it, you're going to be chasing your tail from then on. So make sure you're ready to run. I think a lot of people aren't ready to run when they hit publish. 
Absolutely. They, they, don't know, they don't know what the next step is. They hit publish and they're like, oh shit, I should have done all these 12 things. So it's just that little bit of patience and, and kind of pulling back and taking some time to really know what you want and what you're trying to do. Take your time and do it right. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. sir. That's, and that's I, I think the, the not being professional part has like, is multifaceted in that there's a few things. Number one is being the cover of a book and the editing of a book. You know, the reality is like, there's people out there who don't use editors and you know, that's, that's a thing. Um, but a lot of your bigger self-published books, they're all professionally copy edited, go through full, like mine go through, I have mine, I do my self editing, then I send it off to a full team of betas, then I do another round of self editing, then it goes off to a professional copy editor, then I do another round of self editing and it goes off to a professional proofreader. And you know, I didn't have the money to do all that sort of stuff at the start, but I waited and I saved. And I, I waited until I had the money to do it. And then I did it. And not everyone can do it, but the reality is if you want to make it a career, you know, you need to try and do that. You need to try and make sure if you can't pay for it, make sure that you're getting critique partners. There's ways to do it without the money, right? It's not about the money. There are very expensive editing services out there and there's ones that are very affordable and there's ones that will trade critiques, but it's about making sure that the product you put out is as professional as it can be. And then when you get to the likes of the cover, what a lot of people do is what you'll find is sometimes it's a bit of wish fulfillment. So you'll see guys who have written this book and they love this book and um, they see all these other authors out there and they're going, oh man, I want to have this really cool cover. I want a really cool cover. And they get a really cool cover illustrated. But it's, it's not a marketable cover. And it doesn't fit the genre or the brand or anything you're doing. And then it's out there, but you didn't do the research. And I think another thing people do sometimes is it's, it's easier. One, one, one tip I'd give that I, I did with all of my stuff I pick what I wanted to do and then I went into Amazon and I picked all of the covers by the trad publishing houses and the big indies and I took them and I downloaded all the images and I put it on a big sheet and then I put my cover next to it and I was like not is it beautiful does it look as professional as they do mm. does it look as crisp and as clean would someone pass it and think oh that's a self-published book if you can tell at all that there's a, a difference in a gulf in quality or professionalism. To me, that, that that's a bad thing because I don't want the goal should be that when someone comes onto my Amazon page, they shouldn't even they shouldn't even contemplate who the publisher is. They should go, there's a great book. I'm gonna buy that book. Hmm. And anything you put on there that's different to their normal shopping experience will make them question stuff. I don't know. I'm thinking about like this sort of stuff. I have the original paperback of the fall and then like this new special edition one that you did. I think this is like a good case of, okay, yeah, you can spruce it up a little bit, but you know, it, it doesn't look different, yeah. but I, I'm, I'm with a uh, ain here in that. I, a, a, N, a, N, a, N. Uh, I first saw it and I said, Hey, that's like legend of Zelda. It's a Triforce. <laughs> so someone said that to me a while ago, right? I've never played Zelda. Like, oh, no kidding. I've never okay. played any of the games. Um, and then someone said that I looked it up and I was like, but there's four triangles in mine. And actually, the funnier one for me was that symbol. So that, that middle part is a triangle and then the three triangles as well. But originally, that's actually the same symbol as is on the side of the books. And they're white. So it just happened to be a random color choice that yellow was the color for that book. And then people said it to me. I'm looking it up and I just went, ah, fuck. <laughs> that was my general reaction. I was like, shit. <laughs> Uh, so let's talk about that broken binding special edition. Do you have any feedback and what that ended up looking like? Were you, were you like creative controller with that at I all? I literally, literally just got my copy today. Uh, wait, wait, you just got yours today? <laughs> yeah, everyone was getting theirs. So mine only arrived today, this morning in the mail. And it is so fucking cool. Excuse yeah. my French. Um, but like, I was so happy with you. It's very hard for me to express quite how much this means to me. Like, um, it's incredible but yeah i was um i was creative director for for all of it so i did all the i commissioned all the artwork and worked with the designer for the style of what we're going to do the foiling on and what kind of specs we wanted to get i worked with matt on the kind of specs that were as high as we could get while keeping it one of the big things for me was i wanted it to be as, as affordable as possible for my readers because like i'm gonna make my money off it anyway and i don't want to rip them off i want them to they've been supporting me the whole time i think it's, it's that thing where it's like if people weren't buying my books, I would not be sitting here. 
So like, I want to make sure that if I'm making these special editions, I'm, I'm mostly, mostly doing this so I can have that on my shelf. So I want people to be able to buy it. Like 55 pounds is expensive, but when I go and, when you go and look at the specs that we got on it, you know, they start at about $150 from like the likes of Grim Oak Press and stuff. Like they are, we have the highest quality we can get from so much stuff. So we're about a third the price of the other specials. Well, look, I'm going to say that people pay $250 for each one of those Brandon Sanderson leather bounds. And I think that that, look, what you just held up looked a lot, looks a lot prettier, honestly. So. I, I, honestly, I love, I love Brandon Sanderson's ones. And the thing with his, he's a very unique case because he is making so many his his unit cost is excessively low for, for someone else we're going for. It allows them to get all those extra illustrations, which is great. I actually really like Brandon Sanderson's in comparison. So if I say like I like sub press and stuff, but some of the books there's not really that much extra in them. They just have extra specs. Whereas like that's what was important for me to get the colored illustrations and stuff in ours. Whereas Brandon's at least there's so much art. Like, and I, I love that it's gone into that. There's so much extra artwork and stuff. And I think it's one of the ones where I think it's more worth it, but still fucking crazy money. <laughs> yeah, I'm with Fanatic here. I, I would love, I would buy just, I would do the subscription to Broken Binding if this shipping costs. I, I have one rule when it comes to book buying. I, I will not pay more for shipping than I do the book. <laughs> and so that does I tend actually, to be the case in the States a lot. I'm on the soap. I've been on the soap uh, the whole time uh, out in New Zealand. And it's, yeah, it's currently 14 pounds to sh ship here is it 14 pounds on the sub or is it a bit more than that um mm -hmm. but the way i've done it is i kind of justified it myself i'm not going to buy any other books unless like someone else's comes in and i go i just want that like a big one or one of my friends or something so like basically the way i look at it is a book just shows up for me every month and i'm like great and i just get rid of it in my head you know mm -hmm. it's spent but i'm not going into the bookshops and getting other stuff they're just arriving and that's what i have like almost every book on my shelf right now is broken binding because it just keeps arriving every month right uh, Bo, I think I'm talking about the Way of Kings. I'm pretty sure Way of Kings was two hundred fifty dollars, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, no. yeah, it's the way it's the Way of Kings that I'm talking about as well. Yeah, I, I paid a hundred dollars for Warbreaker. That's the only one that I have on, on Leatherbound was Warbreaker. Yeah. Anyhow, yeah, uh, Broken Bind is, is 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 very 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 nice. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I was wondering how you organize your world building and story behind the curtain, as it were. Yeah, so I have like outliner. I have a big google drive and I have, I have a doc that has like the languages and stuff and some of the cultures <laughs> and history and then i have um like characters i've started to build character stuff i i don't like to get too in depth at like full character sheets and stuff because i know i'm just gonna not go back to them um but now what i've started doing is when i see stuff and i write stuff i start noting them down so that this character is blue eyes, this character is green eyes, that sort of stuff. Just because like it's so easy to trip over. Because like in my head, it's it's a weird one because you read some books and people are like, there's a guy standing six feet away. And like he had blue eyes and he had, to, you won't notice that six feet away. That's ridiculous because you wouldn't bring it up. But in the same vein, if you have two characters right beside each other and they're staring into each other's eyes, eye color is something that you would notice in your internal dialogue, internal monologue. Like so... You know, it, it would feel unnatural for me if some characters were in that that close proximity and never noticed it. So I was like, I need to have it down somewhere because I will trip over it. It's going to happen. Like, that's one of the smallest ones. But yeah, I keep most of it in Google Docs and stuff. Um, a lot of it is in my head and has been for a long time. What software do you use to write? Stuff. Are you just a traditional Microsoft Word guy or? No, I use Scribbler. Scribbler. Seems yeah, like it's Scribbler for me is, is fantastic. It has like 100 million functionalities that I'll never use. But for me, I, I love the interface. I love the way it writes. I love being able to shift my scenes around the stuff a little bit because uh, especially like with the POVs that I have, because some of them are running kind of at the same time kind of thing, I could move them depending on whether I wanted to go from like a fast pace to a slow pace scene or at like a high stakes to like an emotional scene or something. They can shift and Scrivener makes that a lot easier for me. How about the old tongue? Do you got like a codex for this or are you making it up as you go? Yeah, so I have a bit of both. Um, so I would have like general stuff down. So I'd have like verbs and uh, like numbers and things like that. And then I'd have a way I build it. And there's certain like languages that I would kind of like base the, the sounds of the words off and kind of where they come from. So like Danish was a, a big one for me for going through different words and stuff. Um, and then sometimes I'll sit there and I'll go, okay, I want to write this sentence. So I'm going to write the sentence. I'm going to take 10 minutes and work out what it is. 
and then I'll, I'll make sure that's noted down and it's there and I'll break down the words into different parts and how I'm using them and I'll put that down too and then move forward. So like, yeah, it's not like a fully formed anything. I'm not a linguist, so it would be ridiculous for me to even try. Um, I was say, you don't, you don't want someone coming up to you. Now. You don't want someone coming up to you like in a con and just like full on fluent and <laughs> in old tongue. Like, that would be really cool. cool. Yeah. Um, but like you would like, honestly, it's, it's, it's an entire like career to be able to build languages like that, like to that level. Um, but like, I think it, it's, it's, it's a lot bigger than I thought it was ever going to be because there's a lot there now. And like, I recently got an email and I, I, I lost it today. I'm trying to find it again where a guy has emailed me. And he's over in America and he trains canine units and he wants to train the dogs in the old tongue. So he was asking me for um, some translations for like general commands and stuff, which is really cool. That is awesome. You get anything really like uh, people telling you that they named your they named their kids after some of your characters or anything like that? Actually, yeah. There's a, a reader did, uh, the other day, uh, maybe a few weeks ago, Chris, um, and his his baby son was just born, and he is called Erathon after a character that is in the third book. You actually probably know his. Their name came up in the second book, but they don't actually appear to the third book. That's pretty. That's got to feel good. Yeah. It's really cool and really weird. I think the thing <clears throat> for me with all this is I still don't know what's going on. Like it's it's weird. It's pretty fucking weird. <laughs> one one thing that was was cool is one of my readers had said that um she was in work and she has a massive tattoo um on her leg, uh, which has like the words um from the book, the um Dralid Nadrir uh Rikina Nadelva, um, you know, Dragon by Dragon by Fire Broken by Death, and she has that going through the tattoo. Um and then she said she got back to her desk. And someone else from her work had emailed her and signed it off in the old tongue. Nice. Which is weird. These two people totally separately are both reading the books. One of them saw her tattoo, so then emailed her in the language from the books. Which is like, that's weird and cool. That seems like it's meant to be, honestly. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so uh, I know you're still going through uh, through your through your alpha readers and stuff, but uh, approximately how many pages will the ice be? You have an I have idea. No idea. Like, because like the page count this is what i was trying to say so like, i could make the ice 400 pages i can make it 200 pages yeah it's more about the word count so, so that that's why it's harder for me i know readers work off pages but like it's funny for me sometimes when i hear it because people work off pages but the reality is even if it's the same page you could be reading a lot more because yeah. you still have to read the same amount of words so like it's not like you're reading the page at a certain rate like it will take you longer like you do have more words to read um so it's really hard for me to, to do that because it, it will depend um but probably, if I'm trying to guess, I can't remember what the ice was. I just like 200. So I'd say probably somewhere between 250, 300 pages. Right. So, so like a regular novel. <laughs> I know. Okay. I know. But it felt weird for me to, to have a book that's 437 and then call a 57,000 word, 54,000 word book the same thing. Right. Like I feel like, you know, Brandon Sanderson does it too. I think, and, and that like, I don't think anyone's Brando, complaining about more Rio. content. Yeah, no, I don't think anyone's mad about it. I just, I just think it's one of those things where I'm oh, like, I just read The Giver by Lois Lowry. It's like 200 pages. I'm like, is this actually a novel or is this a novella? You know, I don't really, really know what to call it. Maybe it, it, does it come to a word count? Does it go to page count? I don't even yeah. know really, but I just know I, I start laughing when I'm starting to see like, like Stephen King will put out a novella and it's like 400 pages and I'm like, really Steve? <laughs> okay. But then he'll put out a 85 page book and call it a novel. I who knows, who knows? It's fun wordplay. Yeah, no, it, it, it's yeah, it, it's it's really hard to kind of to gauge it. Have any idea? All right, here's a work ethic one. Do you have a word goal you try to hit with each writing session, or do you just let it come to you naturally? Yeah, like I do, and it, it kind of changes. So what I found was, and again, you're gonna find the the science nerd in me <clears throat> that I look at. Oh, thank you. That's, that, that's really nice. Um. I look at it like uh, I look at writing kind of like a like a gas, all right. Which again, ridiculous when you say it like that. But um, basically, it will expand to fill any vessel you put it in. So if I give myself six hours, I'll take six hours to write it. That's just how it works. Like that's it. If I give myself six hours, it'll be six hours. If I give myself two hours, it'll be two hours. So I, I used to work off time, and it was just it ate into my life. Um. So what I do now. In my normal days, what I'm trying to hit is about about two two to three thousand words, um, every day five days a week. 
that's what I'm trying to hit. What I was doing, um, which is insane, coming up for the end of the War of Ruin, was I was doing 4,000 words seven days a week. Oh, okay. So I wrote one... Actually, yeah, because I, I did take a little break so that the maths was off a bit. But I wrote over 180,000 words in 50 days. Um, Maniac. Which was intense like really intense and i think i i'm not the kind of person who um i don't like delete scenes usually i've never deleted one um or chapters or anything. i don't usually cut a lot i usually add when i go to my next uh revision process so there's some people who will write like huge word counts and then they'll hack back some words whereas i don't so it takes me longer to get those words down so some might, someone else might get two thousand words down in, in two hours or three hours but like I will sit there and it, it could take me like six, seven, eight hours to get those 2000 words because I'm, I'm, I pick at them and I'm just not really sure what I want. And yeah, it takes a bit longer, but um, yeah, it's kind of what needs to be done. So you don't have one of those stories see. like uh, like Pierce Brown had a couple of weeks ago where he's talking about how he threw away 200 pages of manuscript because he just, he wasn't satisfied with it. You never had to do that. I never have. No. Um, I know authors who do it. Um, I think different authors are just, their processes are just entirely different. How they approach yeah. things are entirely different. I don't think one's better than the other. And um, chances are Pierce writes a lot faster than me in general. So the good ch- the good chances he writes like quite quickly to get those words down and him losing those words will probably end up equating to how long it took me to write the end result of those words in the first place. So Right, right. Okay. Because uh, I, I think back to that interview, uh, they have the, I forget what it's called. It's like a very famous saying where you have two authors like talking to each other. It was Stephen King and George R. R. Martin. And George R. R. Martin just asked him, how the hell do you write so fast? And Stephen King said, I try to write six pages per day. And George was like, oh, man, I struggle sometimes to write six sentences a day. And I'm like, we know, George. We all know. <laughs> but it, I got a real, I, I have to say, and this is probably one of those controversial things. I am, I have a lot more sympathy for George Martin than I do Rothfuss. I have sympathy for both of them because they're in a horrible position. <clears throat> like, But for me, you have like, I think what, what killed me on Rothfuss was the whole charity thing and convincing people to put money towards that the cause. That was pretty much when that, everybody that, turned on him, yeah. That was a killer because... Because if you didn't even have the prologue to turn over, that means you're not working on it, but you're lying about it, all right? Whereas if you have... And no author owes you anything, all right? But except, for, for as far as I'm concerned, the one thing that an author does owe the readership who has you know supported their career is kind of like honesty and integrity like you gotta just be, be be honest with your readers talk to them like is it if, if you're not there you're not there it's okay you don't owe people the book but you you owe them human decency chat to them and be honest to them and be nice and you have george r martin who he's in a very very different situation where he hasn't written this book in so long but his whole <laughs> series and ending got ruined by a show so if that was his original ending you fucking know he's not writing it now <laughs> um, so like his whole world got turned around because he, he was getting all this stuff ready and that's all that's it's very different and he is actively writing and he's he's actively working on the show and in the world and you know if he was in better health i don't think people would be as you know worried about it but like i have i i, I love george R. R. martin i think i love listening to his talks as the way it goes about it he lives and i think that's part of the difference is why i have more sympathy it's because he lives and breathes what he's doing. Like you see it all the time. And every time he talks and speaks, he is absorbed in this. And I think he's right in winds of winter and he's getting there. Whereas I don't think anyone has any faith that Roth was even, even gives a shit. Like, no, I remember which, a couple, God, it might've been three, four years ago now when like the, the editor like came out and said, I've never seen anything from, yeah. from Patrick. And everyone attacked her. Everyone just like went all on on her. And now after this most recent thing happened with the charity thing, people are like, you know what? Maybe she was telling the truth. <laughs> you know, the, so. the thing is like, look, if he hasn't given anything, that, that is what it is. Like, mm. but it's just the way he's, the way he's carried himself and handled himself around. I think has been very poor. Like, yeah, well, that's, that's, yeah. George, I've never seen George snap at a fan ever. No, like, and you got to think that, everything like, that guy put, he could say, I had a nice dinner with my wife tonight and people were like, why weren't you writing? You know, he doesn't get any nice mentions on Twitter and oh. he still, he's always been just nothing but nice to people. So yeah, it's, it, yeah. I'm I think that's why I have a lot of time for that. I have a lot. Of, I think, yeah, someone's humanity um, and just who they are as a person kind of comes across. And I, I think for me, I just, I just have more time for George Martin. 
Um, See, I have guys, to- and then you have authors like Ryan here who write too fast. They write so fast. Yeah. <laughs> you I think part of the difference is it's, it's, it's weird because in traditional publishing, you're not just <laughs> going against how fast you're writing. You're going against the publisher's schedules. So like you could have no three kidding. books done and they will not publish them that year. It's getting published next year and the year after. Whereas I have the ability to turn my book around and publish it. I finished my book. I finished the 437,000 word book in December and it was published in January. Now, yeah. the difference is I had an amazing team of beta readers, an amazing editor, an amazing proofreader, and I sent them all the bits in chunks. So by the time I got to the finish line, it only had to be this last bit done. So that helped. But the reality is, like, if I was in traditional publishing, you would not be seeing that book for at least another year. That's like, potentially too. I mean, I hear about a lot of authors I've, I've befriended while I've been doing this and telling me. <laughs> Yeah, I turned it in in December, and they say it might be out Christmas next year. I'm like, wow, that's insane. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah it's wild. Which, people wonder, and they're like, oh my God, you know, publishing could be bleeding money. And I'm like, yeah, because you're literally leaving money on the table. Mm-hmm. You have money, it, it's there in a manuscript, and you're not earning it. And it's like, I don't understand why. Like, this, this doesn't make any sense. It's not like a new iPhone upgrade where the people are going to stop purchasing the previous books when the new one comes out. Like all it's going to do is, is start people buying the first books again. But um, yeah, I don't know. I just, I just want to keep writing. I don't, it's, it's fun. No, it's, like, nice. it's stressful. It's refreshing this to... is the most stressful job I've ever had in my entire fucking life. Right. I have never been more stressed, but I also would never go back to anything else. Right. Well, you don't have any grays yet. So there's that. I do. They're just hidden beneath they're the hidden, darker ones. They're hidden pretty well. Yeah. I got to shape mine down to like, you know, yeah. Before, before we came on this call, I was just kind of like <laughs> in there with the sharpie. Yeah. Uh, speaking of that, someone says, "Does his razor shave his chin, or does his chin shave his razor?" I honestly don't know what that means. Um, <laughs> I thought maybe it was an inside joke so with you. I, <laughs> I'm going to say 47. All right, I would go 42. Uh, I already asked you the, the the New Zealand Ireland question. Uh, why did you decide to self pub and did you have a plan in place for how he wanted it to be successful? I guess it's kind of a recycled question. We've already got a couple of times, but well, um. the self self pub for me was just, I was, I did, like I said before, when you asked me what, what, um, what authors, what new authors should do now that might be a little bit different to what they used to do. Um, you know, what, what should they do? Um, for me, it was research and research into publishing, into traditional publishing and into self publishing. And, after looking at some of the stuff for traditional publishing, I just went, you know what? At this point, only time writing too fast is a thing is when the story product sucks for it. Oh, thank you. Um, but yeah, I think I looked at traditional publishing and I went, you know what? At this point in time, like where I am as a person and where I am with what I want to do, traditional publishing is not for me. I don't want to wait two years to have somebody tell me that they've now decided they're probably not going to market my book and they didn't give me the illustrator they wanted. They actually got that other one because it was cheaper. And um, we're not going to have hardbacks this time. And the store doesn't want paperbacks. So, mm-hmm. and I was like, I just don't want the heartache. I was like, I want to be in charge of my own success. And I think that's what got me more than anything else. It was like I was saying, if for the first time in my life, I'm going to quit a really good job. And if I'm going to, and this was me trying to think ahead, trying to, you know, dress for the job I wanted. I was like, if I'm going to quit a really good job, if I'm going to make something my career, I want nobody else's hands being in charge of this. If I'm going to be a success, I'm going to do it on my own back. I'm going to be able to push myself. I'm not going to, this isn't going to not work for like a couple of reasons. There's like one thing I was never willing to allow happen. I was never willing to fail at this because I didn't work hard enough. And I was never willing to fail at this because somebody else didn't back me. I was like, I didn't want someone to be able to pull out from under me. Like I wanted it to be like, this is me. And if I fail at this, it's because of me. It's because I didn't do it well enough. Like, and I think that's, I sat down, I was going through and I was like, yeah, that, that's me. That's the way this is going. I'm not querying. I'm not waiting. I'm not having somebody else email me back and say, this book doesn't have enough of this or has too much of this, or I want you to change all these things. I was like, no, fuck it. Screw this. I'm believing in myself. We're going to do it. Um, and that was basically the, the chat I had, except I'm pretty sure it was all in my head. I don't think I was drunk enough to have it out loud. Uh, speak of that Irish whiskey or single malt well Irish whiskey 
So currently, I, I actually like all different types of whiskey for different reasons. So I have the yellow spot here, which is single pot still Irish whiskey. And then I have uh, Copperhead, the Redhead, Rider's Tears, and the Double Oak Barrel um, Irish whiskeys back there. There's also um, one I recently got to have with my dad, if you guys come over to New Zealand, is the Jack Daniels Sinatra Select, um, which I was like, he likes Jack Daniels, like the, the Gentleman Jack and stuff. I'm 50-50 on them, but I said, you know what? I'll buy a nice one and see what happens. But I also love scotches. And basically, I'm as stereotypically Irish as you can get in that regard. Feed me alcohol and I will consume. Right. We're not really yeah. too picky about it. Yeah. Uh, so Master wants to know about the uh, the audiobook narration. Did you get to pick the narrator? And apparently he's really, really good. Yeah, so I didn't get to pick the narrator. When, when this started, so I got my publisher podium uh, very early. So I didn't really know a lot. I'd never listened to an audiobook. And um, so they were kind of sorting out. That's part of the reason why I was signed to Podium was because I knew that I wasn't going to take the time to publish audiobooks for the next five, six years. I just knew I wanted to write. Like I wanted to write and do my marketing and, and chat to readers. And that's what I wanted. So they took over that and they gave me Derek and I was looking through Derek's stuff and I loved them because they talked to me about what I wanted. And I wanted that kind of received pronunciation English and I wanted someone who had a diversity of accents and diversity of you know intonation and how they spoke and what they did and someone who kind of if a character was angry I wanted the character to speak angry I didn't want them to be like he was furious hi how are you <laughs> I wanted someone who, who acts I wanted a voice actor not just someone who's going to just talk in the microphone and um, you'd be surprised how many of them there are but Derek is Derek is incredible and um, he's so good and he doesn't have as much of a fantasy background he had the um, he's narrated Homodeus and Sapiens, um, so the biggest audiobooks of all time, um, which was amazing. Um, he's also done David Estes' uh, Fate Mark series too, and a few other, a few other, a few other big enough ones. And he's he's brilliant. I'm so happy uh, there. You know, I don't, I don't do the audio thing because I just, I, I can't focus on it. I, I have listening ADD, not reading ADD, but I have listening ADD, big time. I'm right so there I, with yeah. you. I've, I've had huge issues trying to, trying to do. Audio. But I've. But I feel like if I'm hearing about how good of an audiobook narrator is just based off of viewers telling me that, you got one of the good ones. So congratulations I, I on that. I think for me, like I've had a few different ones where I've tried to listen to audiobooks. And what happens is I end up then planning my own book while I'm listening to the audiobook. And then I realize I've been walking for an hour and I don't know what the fuck's happened. Um, that happens to me quite a lot. So sometimes I listen to audiobooks just so I can go plan my own book. <laughs> I think I saw Bo saying something. Okay, he's never seen you play this guitar. That plays into this question I got here. I got to ask you about your singer-songwriter career because apparently you still yeah. have some YouTube videos floating around. Oh, they're there. I haven't taken them down. Yeah, I did a lot of music. I used to, like, I gigged full-time in the pubs in Dublin and stuff. Um, and then when I came back from South America, I took a year off and just did some of that. And <clears> it was one of those things that I kind of always did, but never, never to the length of doing this. Right. Yeah, I studied music oh. for a long time. Uh, it's still still like a good karaoke, but it's just it was one of those things. I was like, this is never going to pay the bills for me, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be a music I, teacher. So I, you know. Actually, do you know what it is? It's a really interesting one that I think is quite important. Right. So people want to become authors. Right. They, they want to go full time. It's they're like, oh, that's that's what I want. Right. And I don't think that a lot of people really grasp that when your hobby becomes your job, you lose your hobby and the passion can die. And mm. they want it, but they don't actually want it. They want the concept of it. They want the idea. They want the dream of the guy who sits down and writes stories about dragons and earns his money and it's great. And that's not the reality of it. Like it's incredibly stressful. It's really high pressure, you know? And the reason I'm bringing it up is because I was the same with music. And so I was doing music all the time and I went full time with music and I was gigging and I was earning full time money. I was earning very good money and because they pay really well for, for uh, musicians in Dublin. It's, it's a big part of the culture in Dublin city. Um, but I was doing it for about a year and I, I ended up sitting down and I was like, I fucking hate this. I'm miserable. I really don't like it. And it, it took me to try out one of my passions as a career to really understand that it just doesn't work like that. Sometimes, sometimes, Sometimes you need to have something that you love just because you love it. Like, well, don't get too really stressed. Important. Yeah, don't get too think... stressed with it because I mean, like, for me, when I started YouTubing, I said, "Look, I'm going to do this as long as it's fun for me," and I still felt like it is I, because I, it is it, all the time. Are you ever you ever think about doing this full? For, no, this is never going to outpace what I went to school to do. 
you know, so I, it, with me, it's about earning. It's about financial stability. It's about insurance, it's about benefits and all that stuff. YouTube isn't offering any of that. And this bubble can burst at any time. So I think it's a little bit different. But yeah, it, it, if it wasn't fun for me, I wouldn't do it anymore. So uh, but, yeah, yeah, I definitely mean, don't stress yourself out. We're in a society where people kind of tell you to monetize anything you're good at or anything you like. Yeah. You yeah. know, because they have, they, there's a thing that's kind of a semi fallacy where they're like, you know, oh, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. And that's a load of bullshit. Like you will, you work really fucking hard. Hmm. You'll just be happier about it. Hmm. Like if you can really find it. But the difference is you might not still love it after you're working in it. And that's where you're no longer working in the job you love. You're just working. <laughs> so have you heard of this phrase uh, that Brandon Sanderson fans use? His his third acts are known for being like just really, really great. And the catchphrase he always uses is a Sander Lanch at the end. So uh, Dan here came up with one for you. He wants to know what you think about it for your books. He's calling it the Cahilicalism. 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 Oh, that sounds horrible. <laughs> like, I mean, like, it sounds kind of cool, but then also, like, can have a... A lot of, uh, yeah, no. No, no. <laughs> that could come across pretty bad. Um, but I do know that, yeah, the endings for, for the books now are, are starting to get a bit of a reputation for that. But, um, but yeah, Brandon Sanderson's ones are nuts. Like, I remember when I read Away of Kings, okay, and I need, this needs to be prefixed with the fact that I loved Way of Kings, right? I really loved Way of Kings. But when I got to the end of it, I realized... That for about a thousand pages, they literally went nowhere. Uh, like, yeah. I mean, I mean nowhere. Like for about seven hundred pages, he is literally just training with his so with his with his crew. Now there's reasons for it, and it's great. It's fantastic. Like you really deep it get deep into the characters and the mindset, and you really care about them. It's it's brilliantly done. But when I looked at it, and people talk about pacing in a book, these dudes did not leave a war camp for like eight hundred pages. Like it was crazy, and then like the last two three hundred pages, the world just explodes. Right. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. It was like that. That name Sanderlanch was earned. <laughs> yeah. No, I say he he's the type of author he he rewards his readers, but there's gonna be times gonna be like, so where is this going? You just gotta kind of trust the process. But yeah, no, but that's yeah, what I mean. Like, seriously, they were just in a war camp for like eight hundred pages. I went back and I looked, and I was like, man, only Sanderson can get away with that. If I had these guys, if I had my characters not leave one spot for eight hundred <laughs> pages, but not work. I, I would love to do that, Brian, but it just takes a lot of, it's one of those things again. Okay. Say they said, Hey, we want you to, we want you to narrate uh, a book that's, you know, 400,000 words. When am I going to find the time to do that? You know? So or that's just say, say, Hey Mike, this book has a cast of 12 characters. We want you to do a French accent, an African accent, a Spanish accent, and an English one. I, I told everybody that like uh, my dream job is to work for like audible. Sure. I'd love that. They like build a studio in my house. Let me work in my house kind of thing. Sure. That, that would be like my, my, my dream job. Cause I do, I read to my kid. He's yeah. very, very strict about making sure that I use different voices and I'm not allowed to use voices that I used in any previous series. So the voices I use in Harry Potter, I am not allowed to use those with Percy Jackson. This kid is taking notes on you. He's yeah, like, yeah, oh, he, dad, very he's going to be an audio booker for sure. He's definitely going to be an audio booker. But uh, I, I don't know. I, it's, it, I would love to do it again, guys. It's just like, I don't know. it's just one of those things. Like, what if they did want me to do something for him? I'm like, when I'm going to find him time to do that? Because it's going to take away time from doing this. It's going to take time away time from doing this, you know. And these are, I'm happy with my 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 kind of method I have right now. It's it's never going to be. I, I think I'd, I'd love doing audio books. I would. It's just. I got too much on my plate, I think, uh, uh, really as it is, but I, I would it's love to one, do it. It's one of those where you never know. You could like try and slip away into it like nice and slowly. You have like Travis Bulger, he was doing it full time and then decides, you know what, I'm going to write a book. And uh, then, yeah, so now he's doing both. Yeah, I told somebody like I wouldn't even have no problems paying my dues and like reading smut books at first. Oh my God. <laughs> Just let that my kids know about them. Hey, here's a pretty nice one. Uh, how did Ryan get so good at writing? I'm reading A Blood and Fire, and honestly, I expect it to be a great story with serviceable writing, but he's easily as good or as better than a lot of traditional pub authors I've read recently. It's really weird for me, okay, because I think you can tell, and most people can tell, like A Blood and Fire is my first book, all right? And as well, I had a different editor for my first book. Um, now, editors can only do so much. You know, you can, you can only polish a turd to a certain point. Um, like, so for me, I found there was, there's leaps and bounds in my writing each time, because I think one, one thing that I, I, I am confident about is my ability to learn. 
and I've always kind of tried to do that and tried to not make the same mistakes twice. If I see them and notice them, I'll note them down and I'll try not to do them again. And I think that's for me, it's, it's, it's the joy of it is getting better, is improving. It's like really working on your craft. Like, and that's what I did. So like when I wrote A Blood and Fire, um, there's a reason why the majority of A Blood and Fire is Caleb's point of view. And then when you go to A Darkness and Light, you have more. That was planned from the start of A Blood and Fire. Dude, I'm not going to lie. When I was reading of Darkness and Light, I was like, another POV character? <laughs> yeah. But, but it, was, it was planned from the very start. So I, I wanted to do multiple POV. And I sat down and I said to myself, do you know what? I'm not good enough yet. I can't do that. I won't pull it off. All the points of view will be the same, um, and I, I won't. I don't. I don't have the skill as a writer to pull it off. But what I could do is if I drop a few POV chapters in here, it diversifies it up, and um, you'll have a. When it happens in the next book, you won't be as startled, um, because there's there's evidence that it can happen. So what I did then was I read more multi POV books, and then I decided that I wanted to have the the fall. So one of the big things when you have novellas is have one POV. Do it in one place at one time. In all of my novellas, I've broken at least one of those rules. So the first one is a novella with four completely separate POV characters. So what I wanted to do was deep dive into the POVs and find a way. It was it was a specific writing task um, that I took a little bit out of context from writing excuses. Um, where basically I wanted to take four characters in the same scene, in the same city, seeing the same stuff. And show it through four different lenses and make it, make each one feel different, and that was my I used my novella as a way to to get better. So then when of darkness and light came around, I knew how to use more characters. Um, but that's what when I the reason I went off on a tangent there is because I really appreciate when people say they like a blood and fire because I always get scared about it. I'm always like if someone like if someone likes a blood and fire, I'm safe. Most of the time, I'm like if you liked it, series is for you because I know that the writing is the weakest. I think it's the same with anyone. Your debut book, it's always going to be weaker. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, Joe Abercrombie has like a, his own blog on his website and he will still go on occasionally and like roast the blade itself about what he would do differently now and stuff. And I mean, it's, it's a lot of people's favorite fantasy book and he will, he will just savage it. <laughs> you know? Man, so, I go yeah. back, when we were doing this special edition, I'm going back looking at Blood and Fire and I'm like, oh, so much I would change. Not story-wise, I'm very happy with my story, um, but just writing. Like just the, the craft of writing, how to do things. I would just little bits and pieces that would just make it so much better. And I, that's the thing is like, it's, it's dangerous for authors to look at their previous works. Sure. Like she's like, shit, I want to change it all. It's like me going back and watching my first videos. It's like, oh, wow. <laughs> like it's, it's funny because like for me, all right. Um, I can look at reviews for of War Room, of Darkness and Light, The Fall, uh, The Exile. I'm like, I, I like those books. I know I did a good job. Mm. I cannot and have not opened up a review for Blood and Fire in a year. Because it's one of the only things. There's actually a fun story that not a lot of people know. All right, This is a, this is a, a fun fact that wasn't fun at the time, but it's fun now. <laughs> so right before I launched Blood and Fire, maybe five days before I launched it, I had sent out my, my e-arcs to, to readers. All right? And five days before I launched Blood and Fire, I got an email off an arc reader who basically said, Sorry to tell you, but this book is not ready to be seen by anyone. Like this book is, it's poorly written. Like it needs so much work. Um, like that's, that's it. Like I'm, there's nothing else I can say to you. And I actually like, I remember I was, I was on my own in the house and I got up and I was like, I, I need to go on a really long walk. And I just went on a long walk and my friend who was like my, my best, my best man at the wedding, he went for a walk with me and, um, we were gone for like six hours just talking about stuff and Amy was like texting me my phone was dead she's like where are you what the fuck's going on why haven't you been home like are you okay are you alive are you dead and um, eventually I got back and told her what happened like and it was one of those weird moments where like that one email and it, this is part of the thing I'm going on a massive tangent here but what you'll see when you go through like um, A War and Ruin and probably in a dark slight as well is male mental health is a massive part of my books like it's really big and You'll see it when, if you ever analyze the character dynamics, you'll see things like like with Kaylin and um, and Damon, where they're both actually in quite similar situations where the two of them are thrust into positions in which they were not prepared for. Both of their fathers have died and they're living in their shadows and they're both struggling mentally with having to, to move forward. 
um, but one has its support system and one doesn't. And one actually took the other's support system. And so it was really interesting for me, but part of it for me then moving forward, which affected it was that I realized that if my friend hadn't come over and talked to me that day, we probably wouldn't have books right now. Right. No, a great like, friend. It was a real, yeah. real interesting one. And it wasn't even crazy. It was literally just going for a walk and talking. It wasn't any deep shit. It was just like, that's it. Just be in there. Like, so for me, when I look back and I go, yeah, I can really pinpoint that one moment. If, if my friend hadn't come over and we hadn't talked out stuff and we hadn't just, just gone for a walk, we, we definitely wouldn't be on this call. And I definitely wouldn't have a, a books published because I would have pulled the button fire. It wouldn't have went out. So it's just a really interesting one for people who are like going to write and thinking about people's opinions and thinking about stuff. It's like sometimes you just got to trust yourself. You just got to push forward and, and know that you've put that work in. And if you put the work in and if you're there and I think a thousand people could tell your book's great and it's weird. One person tells you it's trash and that will stick with you. Yeah. Oh, sure. Sure. I tell yeah. people all the time. It's like, hey, don't let negative <laughs> I tell people they're trash all the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I tell people all the time. I'm like, dude, you're a shit. <laughs> is that I will get shitty comments and people are like, oh, don't let it get you. I was like, are you kidding? I laugh at them because I was like, dude, like 99% of what I hear is overly positive. You know, because I try to have a positive community, yeah. you know, but, you know, it, 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 I'd be lying if I said it doesn't stick in your head once in a while. Like, well, you know, is that like the one person who's just being honest with me? Yeah, no, that, you know, it'll happen. So I, I, if I was in your profession, I don't think I could read reviews at all, like at all. But it's, it's, it's like, for instance, right, there's always this thing, right, with with what authors should do and say around and reviewers and, and all this different stuff. Right. And for me, like I have never, and I will never comment on like a negative review just because there's, there's just no fucking point. Like right. as in, even if you wanted to, you will categorically gain nothing. It will not happen. There is no point. Okay. Like it does piss me off when I see other people's reviews. And I see sometimes when people get personal, they, they attack people oh, yeah. and authors and they're cruel and mean. You cannot like a book. You can give a book zero stars. And like, you can say like this book failed in these aspects. That's totally legitimate, but I've seen people get some pretty bad stuff. I, I don't like it. Um, it's, it kind of gets me a bit. Um, yeah. I, I remember one time, the only time I ever did anything, it was very, it ended up being very funny, right? Because I was, I was on Goodreads and I accidentally clicked on, uh, the review mm -hmm. links. Right. And I was like, okay, I'll not read a few of the reviews. And one of them was savage, like savage for the fall. Like really like, uh, you know, fuck you. All right. <laughs> and I went, and I was reading that. And I was going, Man, this is really fucking mean. Right? <laughs> and, and all I did was go, so what I'm gonna do? What I'm gonna do? I'm gonna hit like. Right? So no comment, no share, no nothing. I was like, I want you to know that the person you said those things about saw them. And then let me know how you feel about it. Like, so just like. And that was it. Never went back to it, never did anything else. Right? Never even thought of it. And then uh Bookborn, um, Hillary Argyle. Uh, asked me to do the author's me read mean reviews, right? And it wasn't that review. It was just a, a one review that said like, this is, what, what did it say? It said, this book is juvenile, juvenile in every single way or something like that, okay? So all I did was just stick out my tongue. Like literally like, like you know, <clears throat> no, I am juvenile, screw you. But what was really funny is in the comments, <laughs> a guy left a comment and said, oh man, <laughs> <laughs> I left a really, really actually unnecessarily long and horrible review for The Fall one time and Ryan liked it and I felt like a dick. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I get shitty comments, I'll make it a point to oh. be super nice and be like, hey man, it's, thanks yeah. so much for watching. They have no idea what to do. <laughs> They're just like... <laughs> but, but that was it. Usually like, I was sitting there and I was going like, I saw that view and I was like, I'm just going to like it because like, you know... I feel like what you said was mean. I feel like if you're a nice person, you'll feel pretty shitty for the things you said, just knowing someone saw it. And mm -hmm. seeing that review was just like, it was very funny because it was clearly a guy who's going to go on, someone left it and they're having a bad day, left a shitty review and they're like, man, I feel like a bit of a dick. <laughs> I burst out crap. laughing. I think Sometimes Zach Argyle sent me a picture of it and I just, I died laughing that day. I find that most people just, they want you, when they're being shit, they just want you to engage with them and yeah. you just don't do it. They, they, they have no idea to, to do. Like, I, I, I actually let that get away from me sometimes. Like, uh, you were in that tweet thread where I was just saying, hey, I'm thankful that you put the recaps at the beginning of these books because, you know, hey, it helps you forget some, some things that I might have forgotten before I start this next 800-page book. You know, I might have forgot some characters or I might have forgot yeah. an event that happened in the last book. That's all epic fantasy. 
And basically got to a point where a guy was saying that me and Patrick need to learn how to read better because we all say, or, or Ryan needs to learn how to write better so his readers can, uh, you know, retain his story Wait. better. And I was you just like, my response, though. Fuck I thought, you. I, I, mean, I thought my response to that was aces. I was like, yeah. But um, yeah, but it was funny because I think it's the way it's the language people choose. Like the language he chose in that was that recaps were spoon feeding readers, right? And that's pretty fucking it's pretty derogatory language in the way he was trying to use it which will get anyone annoyed like you're going like hold on i don't need to be spoon fed okay i just like i don't have the time to go back and read six more books and i think for me when i was doing the recaps the reason i was cool with doing them like legitimately was because i remember reading the wheel of time one of my favorite series of all time and getting close to throwing a fucking book out the window because for the 427th time i was learning what a warder was oh and dude i was like I I'm so in that, book that's 12, not... and I'm like, why are you telling me which half of the one power this is? I fucking know. It's book 12. Don't explain like, this again. Seriously, I was going like, that. that's not a good thing for narrative. It's not something we should want to keep. Like, And the way I look at it with, with recaps is, same way I was saying with like the emails that you send your readers, are a way of showing your who you are. It's a way of your readers looking at it and learning a piece about you. If you're clever your recap is a writing technique. So what I do is say you won't have noticed, or you might you might have noticed, when you're going into a darkness and light, you'll see the character Belina. Okay? You definitely notice Belina. You can't not notice Belina. Mm-hmm. But what a lot of people did not notice was that she was in the first book too. All right? And they didn't notice that she was there. So but purposely I made her this background character that then when you see her later, you go back and go, that bitch was there the whole time. <laughs> like that's, that's what it means. There's kind of Easter eggs I like to leave, but I use the recap to bring her name up. Like in, in, in an inconspicuous way, it's like there was a bard, Belina and Elena, and you go forward and, and it kind of reminds you, like, you can use it to remind readers of things you want them to remember for the next book. So like, if you do it cleverly, it's writing technique too. And um, there's another tangent. At least this one isn't about um, John Wick. So, <laughs> well, I'm glad that you do it because, uh, well, I don't want to say that like it helps if you you miss anything. But you know what? Sometimes in a book that long, you might just forget it. Like you're going to be starting this book here, you might have forgot something that happened in the you know five hundred thousand words here. It's going to happen. It's it's, yeah. it's human nature, especially if you're someone like me that breaks them up over my, I don't binge read them. You know, I read multiple other series in between them and stuff. I think it's a great idea. First one I saw do it was, uh, was James Eilington in, in like And I thought that what a brilliant idea. However, with, of course, with like it's like, Oh yeah, I was wrong on everything that I thought he just explained it to me. Like I was five and I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. I think the only thing for me is like, I'm going to have to start taking the previous books recaps out of them because the reality is I get to the fifth book and I'm going to have about, 50,000 words worth of recap, which I just don't have the word. I don't have the page count for. And uh, what Richard said he decided to do was because of that is he's putting it on his website. Yeah. And I think that's, that's probably where I'm going to go with a lot of it. And just because the books are big enough, I don't, I don't want to have to reduce the font or anything and um, just to fit stuff in. So it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's better that way. And um, I'll probably, I'll probably still keep the previous one. So the directly previous book in there. And I say, look, the rest of them are on the website. All right, here's like the closest I'm going to get to criticism. And I just want you to tell me that with this you're book right there, here. That's actually vodka it. you've been drinking. You're just no, like, no, no. It's, it's, I'm going to take water. It. It's just water. Uh, with as big as this book is right here, I'm pretty sure this this, this complaint that I have is going to be, be, be wrapped up. I know you're introducing a ton of new characters in the Darkness and Light. Yep. But I was like, I need more wrist. I need more Dan. Where are my boys at? You know, so I felt so, like that a little bit. Yeah, well, and that's... Again, you know, it seems a cop out for me to say, but that's intentional. Oh, and then you. when you come into, you'll see it. I'm not going to spoil anything, but basically all of the characters that you will see in A Darkness Light, all those extra points of view, have double and triple the word counts in A War and Ruin. And that's what made the book bigger, is their, their threads and their storylines are far bigger and far more important. You're seeing it there. And that's kind of what I wanted. I wanted car. I wanted people by the end of a darkness and light to have met Dane and you know get more of Belina and stuff, and then go. I want more. One thing I a skill that I, I I learned that I think is really valuable when you're a writer is knowing when to make people ask questions just before you give them the answer. Mm. 
and I think it's one of the one of the best things in the world. And someone goes, "What about?" Oh, wait, never mind. And that's that's what you want. And so for me, I tried to do that on a book level. That by the end, you're like, "Okay, yeah, but I want more of these guys." So then, when you get to a, a born ruin, you go, "Ha ha! What I wanted all along." And so yeah, so ho hopefully you feel that way when you get through it. Or you might go, fuck me, and um, this is probably a good brick to throw through a window. We'll find no, out. No, this would probably put a hole in my wall if I threw I don't even know if I could throw I mean, you know, I'm gonna have to, I can skip arm day. I can just lift this it is, uh, while I, I read it. But uh, no. With, with kilos, the, which is a pretty fucking heavy book. I don't like what's going on with wrist right now. I don't know. We can talk about that after, after we end the call. <laughs> I'm <laughs> concerned. I'm concerned about a character. Hey, do you know the ending? Do you have the ending in your head already? For a lot of stuff, yeah. Um, so the way I generally do it is I have the general broad strokes of the ending from when I started the first book. All right. So I know where stuff's going to be. And then that that's always subject to change because there's, there's points where what I do is I, I plot, but not like these crazy in-depth things. Right, so I'll always have, every time I start a book, I know the ending of the book before I write, I know the ending. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. You said uh, probably. Um, uh, I'm gonna have to change the name of the black guy. I can't just rip that straight from Wheel of Time. Um, but I always know the ending of a book before I start it, and then I'll pick like major beats that need to happen. But what right. will happen sometimes is I will get a character to a certain point. I'm, I'm a big believer in a character should only ever do what's logical. Not not only ever do, but most of the time should only ever do what's logical to them at that time based on who they are and their emotional state so like if i get a character to a position and i've always wanted them to do one thing and then i have them there there are times that my brain goes no the journey they've had now they wouldn't do this anymore and then i have to change my plan because that's the thing that pulls me out of so many books is and tv shows i'll watch them i'll go they wouldn't fucking do that yeah characters like, why would they like it got me so much in the last kingdom i love the last kingdom but you have Uthred. And he literally just does things against his character just to make the plot continue. And you're like, he would never do that. Like this guy, he, he spends fucking a whole season talking, we just want to get back to his family. And it's like, okay, you can go back to your family and be happy now. And he's like, I will swear an oath to Alfred. I'm like, no, why would you do that? Like, and it's, my voice got very high there. And that's because that's how passionate I feel. But um, yeah, so I do have a general idea where the endings are going. Um, and actually it was wrists... I do have Rist's entire story. So it was Rist's entire story that came to me when I was shopping for kiwi fruit. So I literally just walk in. Context for you guys. It's going to have something to do with kiwi. Death by kiwi. There it is. Yeah, just at the head. So funny enough, in New Zealand, they call the people kiwis. There's a kiwi bird and there's kiwi fruits. So I had to explain to them why it's weird for me because I don't say apple fruit or banana fruit. So kiwi fruit is strange and I can't get over it, but it's a thing. You have to keep saying it here. But um, yeah, so when I was shopping for fruit, um, Wrist's whole plot for uh, the next book came into my head. So that's that's solid. Yeah, fanatic. I'll just tell you where I'm at. You're gonna you're gonna have feelings. Let me just tell you things. That's that, that's it. You're gonna have opinions. You're gonna have concerns. But that's good. It's good. It means you care. I mean, you and you and I have talked about this in, in, in direct messages and stuff before about. Why is this whole thing with modern fantasy readers where, oh, well, the first 100 pages are really slow. You mean we are getting to know the characters? I mean, yeah, I like to you're know build, them before the bad shit happens. You're building emotional attachments. Yeah. Uh, like, I, I think know. it's one of the hardest things. It's something I tried to do with The Fall, and it's something that I'm trying to do with um, The Ice as well, is is how you can get people attached to characters in very short spaces of time. Um, I, it, it, it's difficult in a lot of spaces but in something like the fall because of the high tension you know and because of the fact you don't have nobody has plot armor or something like that at all you can't even imagine they do and especially after the first part of the fall uh, nobody has plot armor so like you can look at stuff and you can become attached quite quickly then because you go they could be gone in a minute i need to be attached you can also just so, give yeah. them an animal companion that's going to get them that's going to get them attached or be the animal companion you know so that that also works. So, like yeah, I said, hey, you got to kill the like human characters. Point. That's cool, but but you leave my wolf pine alone. Hey, someone asked yeah, earlier, why why wolf pine and not just wolf? Honestly, just wanted it. And it was more <laughs> the case of like basically the way the reason it came about was because I had the mountain range named, 
Okay. And then I was like, you know what? I want wolves. And I want them bigger and cooler than normal wolves. And um, I was like, shit, John Gwynn already did that. Oh, wait, so did everybody else. Right. And so I was like, okay, we're going to name them after the mountain. And then we have a chicken and egg scenario where nobody will ever know whether they named after the mountain or the mountain named after them. Mm. And um, yeah, that's, that's basically it. And that it also, it allowed me to have loads of really back and forth dialogue, like with the likes of um, Ella and Farda and stuff like that as well. And you'll see there's points. What I love to do is mm. bring stuff from book one and and the fall and other bits into new books so you'll see callbacks all the time where like those little throwaway conversations will come back in emotional ways like you'll see i like to do it where you should be able to pinpoint where a character has truly changed based on a silly throwaway thing they said in a previous book like and it's something that I, i love to do like i'll take notes of things and i'll put down like I said something like this, I can definitely use this at some stage. And then I'll come back to it and go like, yeah, 100%. That's a character reference there. Which is, yeah, it's fun. Well, I mean, I don't know. I haven't read this one yet. But hey, more Animal Companions. I'm, I'm good with that. You can have like a whole novella just about Animal Companions at the, the end. The only problem with having more Animal Companions is like, I have made it quite clear that no matter what happens, even if every other character gets their head lopped off by foreign invaders... Nothing's happening to Feyner. Right. It isn't. Well, it can't. It's not possible. Like he, he will, he will learn to surf. He will go on the waves. He will. He is getting away. So even if, even if the biggest disaster comes and the whole world burns, he won't. It's the only thing I'll say though. I'm like, they'd have a great time. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Uh... John didn't exactly have your exact same method for his animal companions. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> yeah, he, he like he like he liked the pain method. John 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 Gwenza, he's a killer, man. He's he's a killer. Uh, so uh, I, I guess the the last question, and I doubt if you haven't gotten wooed by uh, other publishers, I'm doubting that anyone's called you about uh, securing adaptation rights yet. Yeah, for like TV and stuff. Um, no, like I, it, it's harder. I think I don't think my series is filmable yeah read the yeah. read the poll guys it's like this could never be on tv <laughs> but it, it's not it's not even that it's it's more yeah, it's more the fact that i just don't think people will be willing to risk the budget yeah like and that that's the reason why i think it's great that if um besser of cold does get green live fully like it's 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 brilliant because um i saw someone say a while ago and i can't remember where i saw it basically that the reason we're getting so much recycled ip is because in fantasy a lot of this stuff is such high budget that and, and the industry is so risk averse anyway they don't want to risk it they don't want to risk new ip so seeing something like best serve cold be successful would be amazing and it's part of the reason why i was so upset that the wheel of time tv show was a piece of shit like because if that had been really good and like, i'm like this isn't even from like a we've talked about this i have my own issues with the books all right objectively to me the show was bad it was bad writing it was bad effects the acting was fantastic. I loved the actors. They were brilliant, right? But the writing was quite literal shit in your pants. Um, mm. And it, it, it annoyed me because if that had done really well, we probably would have seen a lot more new IP come through because that's a high fantasy with heavy magic. Like, and that would have been great. Um, and I think it's what makes, you saw with Game of Thrones, like they have to get rid of using Ghost all the time because they were using up all their fucking special effects budget on the dragons. Right. Um, so mm-hmm. yeah, I, I'd be very surprised. Just, I'd be very surprised if someone would come in with something, um, that I would be happy with. Like I, as much as we talked about Aragon, I would never let what happened to Aragon happen to my books after seeing what happened to Aragon. You know, funny as I saw that, that movie that before was the worst I read the book. In human history. But it was and I was like, history. it's not bad, I guess. And then there was like a kid next to me, like 12 years old, that was just crying when the movie was over. And I was like, what happened with him? And his, I, dad, I his, me, his dad was like, it's not like the book at all. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. But I think what got me, right, is, and I think we're, we're way past spoilers for a book that's out that long, okay? Yeah, but like for me, um, if I remember correctly, at the end of the first book, he gets a really heavy injury that like, really affects and drives the whole plot of the second book 
and they didn't give it to him in the film. No, they gave you they gave you the they, Star Wars A New Hope ending, yeah. No, but it means they knew it was bombing before they released it. Mm. Because they got rid of the path to book two. Like mm. literally it defined all of book two. Like, so they got rid of that. And I was like, these guys these guys literally did not care. They were like, we're gonna put some money into it and then we don't give it a shit. And I was like, yeah, oh, I, man, I feel like that's miserable. the way it's it's been with fans. Like, superhero movies look at like how much money those movies make now and i'm like i think back to before years and years and years and years and years, and years ago where we us comic book fans were begging for them to make these movies and then when they would make them it was just like they have no idea what they're doing they're just using the name and saying hey we'll just get a quick you know few hundred million and just close up shop and not make another one for another two years and then all of a yep. sudden christopher nolan makes a batman movie like look this could be done seriously and all of a sudden it's like whoa if you take this seriously, people really love it. Or Stephen King adaptations. They make it. Oh, people yeah. like it when you follow the story of the book? Wow, amazing. It, so, it's yeah. one of those things where I think stuff stuff has to change because <clears throat> there's things that don't transfer across mediums. And it, it, I think we're in this weird, toxic environment where if you change anything, people are like, oh my God, it's not real. They're like, oh. yeah, we, we know, but it's TV, right? There's a black elf. I'm like, yeah, I know, but get the fuck over yourself all right like seriously there's 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 worse problems with rings of power than that like yeah, and he, he, he was one of but those two characters that got so much shit were two of the fucking best actors in the whole thing they were great like really fantastic and it was just like all this sort of stuff happens and the way the time like there was a few bits and they're changing it right and i go on i don't it, it's the things they changed i don't mind things changing it's the things they changed so you take one of the only strong, supportive, positive father fixer, father figures in like, you know, the last few decades of, of fantasy fiction, all right, in, in Abel Kuthon, who literally taught Matt everything. He taught him everything. The whole point is he, he has raised Matt and strong abuser, and supports yeah. Matt. And you turn him into a fucking drunken dickhead. You, for me, we don't have strong, supportive father figures in, in fiction from that era. It, and that was a special one for me. And him and Tam were both amazing. And so to do that, I was like, that's just shitty on a character. And then you have, but not only that, his whole journey, his whole fucking journey for like three books is going from someone who was whiny and unlikable to someone who you didn't realize was actually a hero all along and never let himself believe it. And you took his whole arc and condensed it into a scene. And now you have no character development. And you did the same thing with Perrin. His whole arc is coming to terms with him and his strength and who he is. And I always sympathize with their, with Perrin because my parents always told me I'm six foot four. They're always like, be careful because you can hurt smaller kids. And like, I always saw that and you watch them battle with that. And they're like, nah, let's make him hack his misses with an ax. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then we'll you know, I was going to let that go. Uh, I Look, here's the thing with that show is I tried. And for like the first Four or five episodes, me and my friend Mask were we, we were trying to stay positive. We're talking about the stuff that we did yeah. like. And then from like episode five on, we just couldn't anymore. Just like I think I was having huge problems at like the first two episodes to me were like besides that horrible writing, you then strapped the plot to a runaway train and fed it crack. It made no sense. Like literally, these dudes are like they're from this random village, everyone they know and love is there. You know, they're all about the two rivers, right? And this horde of Trollocs are coming down the mountain and Moraine is like, yeah, guys, so they're going to kill everyone in the village. Uh, if you follow me, the stranger you've never met before, I guarantee you they won't kill anyone. And not one character even said, hmm, I'm not sure. They all just left with her. There was no argument at all, right? And when it got to like episode, I think it was like six, I really liked six. And then it just got ridiculous. Like they broke the entire magic system. So like they turned it that like two, two apprentice, not even apprentice. I said, I combined with three that didn't even make it eradicated an entire army of thousands of Trollocs. And you're like, mm -hmm. why do you even need the dragon reborn? Where like literally no matter who he is, whether it was a man or a woman, which again, it just made no sense because he wouldn't fear a woman because he wouldn't go insane. So that, that just made no sense plot wise. But outside of that, why would you need them? You have five randos over here who can just gas everyone. Like, and you have a whole tower of hundreds of like, way more powerful ones. Like, as in, you just basically 
just introduced an army of nuclear warheads into this series. And I was like, nah, do you know what? I made that decision. I'm like, I'm not going to watch the next season. I was like, yeah, if somebody was... tells me that it's really good, I'll, I'll go and watch it, but I'm not going to waste my time on it. And that, that I, I, wouldn't, I, really I, wouldn't be, be I wouldn't be too concerned about that. I wouldn't be too concerned. <laughs> I, 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 don't think, I don't think I'm going to be, yeah. Like literally the preview I saw, like the, the Sean Chan looked cool. That outside of that, I'm like, yeah, I, but that's it. I think like it, it was the things they changed. They changed the foundations of the entire magic system. That's a little bit of a big thing to yeah, change. And like much. the core of characters, they, they literally got rid of books worth of character development in a single scene. And I think they, they kind of didn't understand. They've obviously never read Brandon Sanderson, even though Brandon Sanderson was there because they didn't put the journey before the destination. Oh, absolutely. And I know when, when the red flags were there and I did a video on this like two years before the show started. I was like, all those red flags are there. All you got to do is listen to Brandon Sanderson and listen to interviews with Rafe Jenkins and know that this is not going to go well. And I was like, Brandon yeah. Sanderson's the most gentlemanly person on the planet. He's not going to just savage us. But he was just yeah. like, yeah, I read their scripts and I gave them suggestions. And I said I was really surprised with some of the things that they're doing. I'm like, that's Brandon Sanderson speak for guys. This is going to be dog shit. <laughs> but uh, and then Rafe's like saying, "Oh no, this is going to be a, a different turning of the wheel. We're not going to do this or that or this or that." Like, wow! So pretty much the whole foundation yeah. of the story you're going to change. That's your get out of jail free card. So it was, I, think, I think even that got me though is even that didn't make sense because Randall Thor didn't exist in a different turning of the wheel. Mm. When the wheel turns, it's different people, mm. same souls. That kind of reincarnation principle, but it's like Randall Thor and Parent. They don't exist. If that wheel turned, it was. <laughs> um why is my brain disappearing um loose theron like mm -hmm. is in you have a different person like there's been different dragons across the years if it was rammed every time people are like man my name is really popular yeah so, i think yeah, brand actually had like a, a live viewing where they were watching the finale together and like <laughs> you can just, just like crying. feel it yeah Oh man, it was so bad. And here's the thing is my wife hasn't read the books and she said that she was going to watch the show because she, she heard me talk about it for a while now and she wanted to see, and she was mostly on board. Like the last episode, she's like, I don't even understand what's going on anymore. She's like, it's breaking its own rules. <laughs> they yeah, do. It, it, it's, it's a weird one because like you have people saying, oh, look, it's, it's just terrible fan fiction. And then you have other people going, stop being so like derogatory and horrible. And go, no, but like, if you actually look at the definition of what, what fan fiction is and you go and you see this, he has actually changed enough that what you are doing is you are creating new versions of that fiction. That is what you're doing. So it is quite literally fan fiction. He is a fan and he's creating fiction. So there's a difference between adapting. I think things need to be adapted to the new mediums, but when you change core elements of a, of a magic system, of a story to that degree, it's, it is new fiction and therefore falls under what would be fan fiction. Same way as, I don't know if you've ever seen the Maze Runner, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. We actually so talked about. They the like. Flavor. I read the books. I read the books. Love the books. And then, like, I was watching the the first one. I was like, okay, I get why they got rid of this telepathy. That's pretty hard to do sometimes. And they're like, oh, well, they, oh, this isn't the same story. Like, I mean, yeah. I mean, like this, this is this could be written by someone else. This is a different series. Like, it was just weird. I didn't know. My wife and I saw the move, the first movie, and we liked it so much that I went because the whole series was done. We went and got the the trilogy box set. We just passed around like over a weekend, all th and we read all three of them. We loved it. And then we went to go to opening night to go see uh, what Scorch Trials, and like 15 minutes in the movie, we both looked at each other like, "Oh no, What's happening? <laughs> what is happening?" Yeah, yeah. So, what gets me is that it's it's always so polarizing because you see it on Twitter and people are like basically like. If you didn't like it, you're some racist. Oh, yeah. And yeah. that you're this and that. And I'm like, what the fuck? It's like, no, I thought the actors were amazing. It was mm. just shit. Like, and I was really upset that it was shit. I didn't want it to be shit. I was so excited for it. Oh, it's like, my son who has to read the books. He liked all three movies. So, you know, go ahead. <sighs> you know, it, it, sometimes it is bad. It is bad. Like, I'm seeing a lot of in the comments people trashing The Last Kingdom, uh, the TV show. I loved it, but I've never <laughs> read the books. No, I love there's, there's the, it was the thing for me so i haven't read the books um but i loved it but that part that specific thing that i mentioned it does yeah. happen a lot when you go back and you look at it there was no reason for things it, it they were hemmed in by the books he does it in the books so in because i've talked to petrick and um, petrick's read the books and petrick has a lot of strong opinions about this um but yeah like it Bernard Cornwell when he's writing the books that's what he did like he got to the end of it and it was like okay like naturally that's a great resolution and then 
all of a sudden Utrecht will become a different person just long enough to create conflict that should never have existed mm. and then it will move forward and you're kind of going Jesus Christ this this like this dipshit like Utrecht is like one of the, the smartest characters in the whole series like he's just he is like politically savvy he's strong he's powerful and then for five minutes he will flip to being a fucking idiot just long enough to facilitate the plot and then go back. No, and my I'm wife like, would always be like, why would he do that? And I'm like, because they've got three yeah. more seasons of television. That's why. <laughs> but that's that's it. So it wasn't, I love the show. Those The show was hemmed in by those decisions. And they actually stayed quite close to the books from what I've heard. And that was something they had to do. Same. Pet Patrick gets a lot of us. Pet Patrick, you... You definitely you should get a bottle for Patrick for sure. I think he bought a lot of people no, in your series for I'm sure. Actually, I and there's a good chance I'm actually going to meet Patrick um soon because I'm actually going on my honeymoon and we might be in the same place. Oh, that's um, awesome! So if we're in the same place, we might go grab some food. And Patrick, Patrick was great. And you too, both you and Patrick. Um, I can see quite quite. It, it's cool because I have like obviously my my analytics from people sign up for my newsletters and stuff, and I can like. <laughs> quite literally see the spikes when both you and Petrick pick up the fall. Uh. Like, is in very tangible spikes. It's like, you know, on that day, it's like, oh, I have 800 new signups today. That's interesting. <laughs> like, that's a it's lot. A, people <laughs> love that word free, man. They love it. They, they, they can't I'm, get enough of it, you know. I'm so. telling you now. It is, it, is, it is unsurprising how much people love the word free. I mean, that video I made yesterday, I already got people telling me I'm wrecking their TBR, and I'm like, good. That's what I'm here that's for. That's exactly what I want to hear. I'll be here all week and for sure. Honestly, this this is an interesting one that I think you might appreciate. And um, so, in the like I said before, right now this year, and the first six months of this year, I've sold over double the amount of physical copies of what I sold for the entirety of last year. And I have a working theory that that is due to you and Patrick because the way it usually works, this is just a thing. Just this is just openly chatting and talking now. Like this is like a basically. The way people who generally read traditionally published books read are physical books because they used to go into a bookstore. Right? There's, there's quite different demographics. They, it isn't usually quite high ebook sales because they charge through the roof for ebooks. You know, why would you buy a 15 pound ebook when you can buy a 15 pound paperback? So people buy paperbacks. And whereas the indie scene is quite heavily geared towards ebooks. So what I'm trying to correlate these time frames, I'm looking back and going, yeah, that, that is starting to make sense. A lot of your readers or your, your viewers who will come over to take a look at my stuff then will go, that's, yeah, I'm going to buy the paperback like I always do. And I think that's actually a genuine thing that's coming through, like which is just an interesting little thing that I was looking at the other day when I was cross-referencing the releases of videos with spikes in paperback sales and a continued move in paperback sales because as they sell, the rank goes up. As the rank goes up, more people get them. So it actually starts to self-facilitate. So it's quite interesting, really cool. Yeah, the, the free book has cost me 40 books and four audiobooks. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's, but that's actually what I've said to people before. They're like, like, oh, you're wasting your stuff. You're wasting <clears throat> this book by having it for free. And I'm like, you have no foresight. Like, the idea is that if you believe in your content, if you really think that your book is good, you know, if you give it to someone for free and you have more books... Chances it's, are, it, it's the it's the home. drug dealer thing, guys. It's what drug dealers do, yeah. you know. You know a little smack, little smack. Just first, give you a little taste for free. It's a free sample. There's only there's three people who do it: so authors, drug dealers, and ice cream places. Okay, that's it. Yeah, with, with me is I I did tell him like, hey, thank you for sending me these, but now you've cursed me that I've got to make sure I, I pay that outrageous shipping to uh to get the rest of them on hardcover, and I'm pretty sure they aren't gonna get smaller. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, the only difference is like it's just with the signing of them. So like, obviously getting them from different places is is the issue. But like, hopefully they'll be able to do more more tours and stuff because like when they come from Amazon and stuff in the US, the shipping isn't crazy. Um, especially most people in the world seem to have Prime for some reason. A war a war in room was oh, eighty dollars. No, 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 no. So that's this is this is what happens, right? So especially if you're looking on Amazon and if you're looking on the likes of what was book depository and stuff. So for different reasons. So I don't get my hardbacks printed with Amazon and uh, Amazon don't like that. So every now and again, what they'll do is they'll, they won't do the direct sale from my printer and they'll do like a secondary sale from a different site. They're charging fucking crazy money. So Warren Ruin has been the same price from when it launched to right now. And it's like $32 in hardback. That's it. Um, I think it's 32, but it's, it's, a, it's in that region, like around there. I've kept it as literally just to try and keep my margins the same. 
holy shit, that was paperback? Sorry, I saw the comment. Um, paperback should be even cheaper than that, all right? So paper, paperback is set. Its retail price is like 20 something dollars. But she's in um, Australia. Does that does that make a difference? And she's Jason Oh, yeah, Australia. we'll double. Um, and actually, there's another issue with um, paperbacks and hardbacks in New Zealand and Australia, and that is that um, they charge tax on books. <laughs> which uh, America don't do, uh, the UK don't do, Europe don't do, and Ireland don't do. So books are inherently more expensive. So they're more expensive to print in Australia and they tax them more. So the prices go up, um, but it should not be anywhere near that region. But sometimes what happens if you look at like book depository, people are like, oh my God, free shipping. It's not free shipping. They take the free shipping and they put it onto the price of the book, uh, like directly onto mm. the price of the book. And um, so the problem is it then looks like the book is eighty dollars, but that's not what's happening. They're they're making you think that I'm charging you more money and they're taking your money. Um but that does happen particularly around launch and um, when stuff's trying to, to upload, it gets really messy and it's really annoying. Like the only places where I can actually control that is like with the broken binding because they're they're smaller and they literally just put the price on and that's it. But it's when they're trying to source the distribution to Amazon and stuff, they just they, they fuck it up all the time mm. the only reason i do it is because the hardback quality is so much better with my printer than with amazon and i want the better print get out there amazon's hardbacks don't even have dust jackets um so i, just, I wouldn't want to go with them myself yeah i did one of the print offs of the fall the paperback and <laughs> like the so front annoying. covers like curved and <laughs> you know, that that's actually that's not the printing that is them literally just breaking it yeah you bought it? Sorry, I'm still, I'm looking at the comments and like I don't know James is like, no, I'm I'm not complaining. I bought it. Oh it Jane, like, Jane's gangster. Yeah. Yeah. She'll do Jane, it. Jane, I appreciate you and I think you're fantastic. Yeah, she's awesome. She's she's one of my favorites. Now, she's oh, one of the moderators on my be, Discord. My advice would be next time, don't buy it. Buy the ebook or something, nice and cheap if you want to read it. And then if you want the physical one, wait a little bit because they are there. They are cheaper. They will be cheaper. Like it's just they they just do that and that money isn't going into my pocket. Mm. Like it's 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 literally just going into some secondary reseller who is selling at a ridiculous price. And Amazon are like, Well, if you're not gonna sell your book through me, we're gonna fuck you around a little bit. Right. No, um, I so, feel how bad that some 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 of the authors are getting, so much. are getting screwed with the with the printing version that they're doing it at Amazon, I I feel bad for them because they're talking about. I don't imagine you guys are making very much money off of that, you know. Just no, know. like like now, um, like because I do a lot of my stuff through Ingram Sparks, so like my books available through Barnes and Noble and like Waterstones in the UK and like what Barnes and Noble and stuff. It's funny, Amazon are like, one, are like the biggest seller in the world, but Barnes and Noble and like Waterstones and stuff. When it comes to books, they're just more professional. Barnes and Noble's price, that, that will be the price of the book. That's the retail price. There's no fucking around. Yeah. That's it. They ship it out to you. Whereas Amazon, because they, they'll have their own one that they sell, but then they'll have like all these different buying <laughs> options where there's like six stores selling it on Amazon and they put crazy money on it. It just, it makes it a bit messy. But like sometimes it's easier. It's easier for Americans in the UK. You can get Waterstones and Barnes and Noble. But Australia, Australia and New Zealand is still hard. Like I'm here and I went to that book fair and that I was speaking at and like I felt bad. I was like, I don't want to bring my books to sell to people because like, it's too much money. Like they're very expensive over here. Um, yeah, and they're, they're heavy to tote. Like, they're very heavy to tote. Yes. <laughs> but it, one point, I think, I think it's 1.6 kilos for a born room. So that is not light. That is no, what? Two, no. two, three, like three point. Yeah. Like, like nearly four pounds. I think I'm testing the durability of my desk right now. Having like all of them stacked up right here, you know? Okay. That's dramatic. But like, I feel <laughs> you know, it's, it's still cool. Do you think you'll ever get to a point where you just straight sell like sign copies and stuff or, or or like this like straight off your website you don't have to go to anyone else you think you'll just be all doing it all on your own so i actually spe I, I specifically didn't want to do it so i was selling signed copies i moved away from it um because it's just not time and cost efficient for me so like when i'm signing the books and, and, and wrapping the books and shipping the books myself it's hours and I, I was doing that and like i was getting a little bit more money but you know I wasn't writing as much. So I, I purposely have outsourced my science books to the Broken Binding um, who give me more money than uh, like Amazon and stuff do. And they look after it and they look after the customers and they send them out. Um, and they're, they're fantastic. Like, so I outsource it to them. And then that means people can still get signed copies. All I have to do is sign my pages and send them in bulk over to them and they put them in. 
and they do all the logistics and it's great and it's the same with the, the hoodies there that's actually um a two-person husband and wife team in the uk who are readers of mine and they're amazing and then um, like they've offered to, to the list them and they do a great split and they do a great job and it's so cool it's really Even nice quality though, guys i was very impressed with the quality of this it's very awesome oh, I, yeah i'm really happy with them because that's mm -hmm. it's all them like direct to garment ink stuff so it's not like peel away crappy quality stuff um, which is really cool. I mean, it's summer in Houston, so I won't be wearing it anytime soon, but you better believe this bad boy is going to work out for Christmas. It's going to be very nice. Very, very nice. Very nice stuff. Well, uh, I hope yeah. that uh, this Dragon this Dragon Con credentials thing does go through and we can throw down a Guinness or something together. It could be a lot of fun, I think. And uh, the, only, the only issue with that sentence is you spoke in the singular. Oh, a, a few Guinness. Guinness I? Guinness eyes? <laughs> Um, you're the Guinness, writer we actually we did that to a friend before um uh we, we convinced her when we were traveling to ireland that the plural for cows was cow eye cow eye she, she was like no it's not i guess like, yes, it is like anything beginning with c like Colossus i'm reading that Islington book and it's got all this roman stuff and everything is octavii and xdi and septimi and stuff so i'm doing that with like everything now i'm saying putting two I eyes saw, i said boasting about that and I, was, I was like i can see how that would be hard i could see how it would be like you know to sometimes it's, it's like if you're using the same words again and again and again myself, like anything, you'll notice it. Is if, if I not use it too much, it will stick out, like too close together. But then if you're speaking in a way that always has like two eyes at the end of shit, like it's hard to avoid. Well, Albert, see, Ryan's a rock star. So, you know, I'll get my five minutes and then he'll have to move on to the rest of his fans here. So, you know, but uh, I'll, 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 some drinks and chilling. I'll try, I'll try, I'll try to get him. My if, if I get to go, you know, I don't even know if I get to go. I, I, I just I'm, I've reached the point in life where like I, I'm not I'm not going as a as a pleb to stand in lines and stuff. I don't do that, but you know they want to make me they want to make me an actual <laughs> guest. I'm, I'm yeah. too cool for a line. Which, which <laughs> this is the funny one, right? So you're saying that, but I was talking to some other groups of authors that go to Dragon Con all the time, and um, it was, yeah, it's really cool because you get to like when you're an attending professional, like you have your own special cues and stuff. I was like, what? He's like, yeah. you didn't think you had to stand in normal cues, did you? I was like, yeah, I just assumed. Yeah. Like that, that uh, I'm just there going. I'm, yeah, I figured I was going to be standing beside 14 people dressed as cartoon characters. I figured that was going to be the day. No, I don't. I don't people. need anything special. Like I said, I just want to. I just want you know, like I just need a Rolls extra, Royce. And, uh, well, see, here's the you know, thing: my brother, fridge. my brother volunteered at Dragon Con for decades, and it's a lot of work. A lot oh, of work. Oh no, shit! Like, it is. Yeah, those I'm, guys work hard. I'm not going on vacation to go work, man. <laughs> Sorry, I'm too old no. for this shit. So I was like, look, if you guys, I mean, because we had comic blues out here, they wanted me to moderate, they wanted me to MC, they wanted me to do all this stuff. And I was like, I, 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 it's kind of a big deal for a con that we don't even know how it's going to do. But I was like, you know, Dragon Con's a big deal. So if they wanted me to do something, yeah. sure, I could do that. But I don't expect to do anything. I know I think, that they, they have like the average attendance their, like, is like 100,000 attendees. Yeah. Yeah. So, which is nuts. Uh -huh. Well, we'll see. We'll see what happens. But, you know, hey, should be fun either way. I've but... seen a comment there from, I, I don't know even, I don't know how to pronounce that. If it's Ayane or Ayane. Ayane, yeah, that's what I was struggling with earlier. Yeah. I, first, yeah, I thought so, it was one of your character names. And then I was like, no, that's that's not it. Yeah, no, I, I would 100% personalize any books. You're at a stage now where because of COVID, I have not gone to conventions and I have not sat there with readers or done signings. And because I'm an indie author, like, you know, I don't have the bookshops aren't like, Hey, come do a signing. Like they're like, who the fuck are you? Right. So I don't really get that opportunity. So like you have me now make me personalize everything. Just fucking be like, right. Sign all this shit, you know, sign my dog, like do whatever you give me, you give me, give me Zach Argyle's books. I'll sign his books. I don't care. I'll sign <laughs> anyone's books. Like we'll do full chaos shit here. Like you give me whatever I'll sign it. Like it's easy. Yeah. I went That's to Pierce right. Brown signing with five hardcovers in my hand. He was like, dude, bring whatever you want. I'll sign. I'll sign your water bottle yeah. if you want. He That's signed my friend's Kindle. Quite literally why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a good time. So, well, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to do this. Uh, it's, it's been, it's been fun. I still feel like we could probably keep talking for a while, but you know, I do got to work tomorrow. You know, it's, like, it's, we uh, have, yeah, I have to, I have to work today. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like we still, yes, it's crazy. I just want to like, Thank you very much. Like we're, we're 100 people are still here. We're two and a half. I know. Here. I know. It's wild. So that's that's it's wild. pretty sweet. Yeah, the, you're you're very likable. I bet you've sold a few books tonight, man. I I, I think that uh, uh people, I would be happy people if, if, it's it's if it's it's, it's, it's one of those things where people if if someone seems like a genuinely good person, they want to support them. I think at least at least that's what the the vibe I've gotten from my audience. So uh, I I hope that more people will give 
your books to try. It sounds like a lot are actually jumping on. Uh, I'm excited to continue myself, especially since a lot of people told me the Exile is the best one that they've read so far at that point. So I'm excited to find out for sure. Is, you know, I'm, being, I'm very happy with the Exile. I'm, 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 I'm happy with it. It came out the way I wanted it to come out. And it's one of those, like, all the books were tough in their own way. Like, but the the Exile, the Exile was tough. I think the, the two novellas, Exile and the Ice, are, were like really hard in their own way because writing the novellas can be weird. Because you're sitting there being like, are people going to look at this and feel like, did we really need this? Did mm. we really need it? And I'm sitting here writing it going, but it's fucking cool. Like, you know, <laughs> I'm enjoying myself. But you have that in the back of your head. I remember I looked at, I saw these good reviews. It was very funny, right? Because like one of them was like a one star review or something. And it was like, um, like this was just absolutely not needed. Could have been summarized in like a chapter in book two or something. Like, which it clearly couldn't be. Like, that was a ridiculous statement. But I was like, okay, cool. You have your fun, right? And I was like, yeah. But then a writer book is another review. And the review is just all caps, Dane fucking Atiris with exclamation marks. And I was like, that reaction right there is exactly why I wrote that novella. Right? Because I was like, you know, if, if 100 people think it's pointless, but one guy turned around and says, Dane fucking Atiris, I'm like, yep. Yeah. Well, that's Dane isn't my favorite so. character yet, but I'm having a feeling he's going to be. So that's the vibe I'm getting right now. He so he very... has moments. There are moments where things happen, and uh, stuff is cool. Yeah, he he does things. He does things that are cool. He he does things, and stuff happens. Yeah, yeah this is exactly not the did we need this kind of prequel, which is good. Yeah, yeah, right on. I will take it. All right. Well, hey, man, thanks a ton for doing this. Uh, for uh, Let me keep you this long. Uh, I know you're probably like itching to go write like yep. you're probably 3000 words after we hang up here. And uh, I told I told you that your biggest regret having me on was me was me not letting you get off. So no, it's, it's fine. I would talk. I would talk all night for sure. But you know, in fact, I'm going to be honest with you guys. After we get in the call, we'll probably talk for a little bit more. You know, that's why I yeah. <laughs> like Pierce Brown was like, oh, I got to go write. And then we got off the call and then we talked for like an hour afterwards. So well, it's I my fault. That's what that, happens. It's my fault the book four is going to be delayed, guys. So there, you, you But this it. is what happens with authors. You sit us in these fucking houses on our own with nobody around us. And then you're like, hey, come talk. And I'm like, please, sir, can I talk? Can we, can we have a conversation? I haven't seen a human in 60 days. Anytime we've been talking about having a, uh, like I do the Saturday Night Nights thing, which probably wouldn't work logistically with your time zone. But I, I do like morning editions you know, to, to work with time zones. And I was thinking about having a, like a, a group of authors on. And I, I, I right now I feel like you and Richard Swan bantering back and forth would be a lot of fun. I gotta I gotta think about that third one. But, uh, do you know, we'll do you know who you should get on, just in general? Okay. There's a, a human being who for me is probably I've never heard him say things that I haven't <laughs> loved listening to, and that is Evan Winters. <laughs> He's just one of the most intelligent, articulate people I've ever met. And then He'll talk about stuff. I've done a panel with him before. And he just, anything he says, he says better than you could. And if I'm sitting here being like, this guy's a fucking wizard. Yeah. Not because he's Gandalf, because every word that leaves his mouth is beautiful. Like I've never, yeah. I've actually, yeah, I've sat there many times in awe and I've said it to Evan as well, like, like on, on, on that call. I think a lot of people have said it to Evan. It's just the way he, um, the way he puts things across and the way he thinks about them is just brilliant. He, yeah, having him on, I'd have him onto a call just so I can sit there and listen to him. It'd be the only time in my life where I shut up. Maybe I'll try to do that when he puts out book three, which hopefully soon. You know, he put out those first two so quick, and now I feel like I've been waiting for book three for a couple of years now. Yeah. I think that's a lot, and it, it's kind of a symptom as well with a, a lot a lot of the like newer, and Evan, Evan's different, but I think with a lot of people who become authors is they spend 10 years writing one book. Yeah. And then, especially to, sell, to send it to, to traditional publishing, they spend 10 years writing one book, and then try to go, oh, cool, we'll buy it. All right, sweet. You have eight months to write the second one. And they're like, the first one took me 10 years. I was like, <laughs> All right, that wasn't part of the deal. You have eight months. Yeah. And it's just, it's it's one of those. So I think for me, that's why like I wanted to like get that next book out right now, just to teach myself to finish a book. Because it's hard. Like every time it's hard. It, it starts from ground zero again. All right, well, I look yeah. forward to like, uh, us talking again in like two years and you're like all silver haired. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. Yeah. It's going to be worth Don't it. Don't worry. I'll, I actually think that whatever um, colorants are in the whiskey is helping me stay without the grays for the minute. Right, man, that's so that's, that's, that's the trick. Magic. Eat chocolate and drink whiskey. You heard it here. There it is, you guys. Don't forget to eat some bacon. So, guys, uh, thanks for watching. Buy Ryan's books. I'm going to put the links down below. And uh, I think you're going to have a great time. And uh, yeah, Buy my books. We. <laughs> 
and we'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks for watching.